afternoon, everybody. I'm not sure if this is on. Todd, can you hear me in the back? Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. So I won't talk as loud. But, uh, welcome. Uh, we've got a, an afternoon packed full of information for this group. And I want to go over a few things before we, we uh, introduce our, our first speaker. Uh, the restrooms are outside this door and uh, kind of the first entryway to the left. There's a men's and women's restroom that way. Uh, in the back, we have water and some snacks. And Todd, our food service director back here, thanks for organizing that uh, for us, Todd. Uh, we do things that we'll just do it uh, where it's really informal. I don't take breaks. Just take a break when you want to take a break. If you got to go to the bathroom or you need five minutes to step out, just go ahead and, and do that. Uh, so uh, unless you say, hey, we want to take a break, but that's just kind of how, how it goes. So all the doors are unlocked. Uh, we'll have some more people joining us uh, as the afternoon goes on. And so, again, just feel free to, to come in and out as, as, uh, as you wish and, and grab a snack in the back and, and a, a bottle of water or, or something along those lines. So, so today our, our, our goal was to create awareness. And I'm just getting the body temperature back down. And I am, I am guilty of coming back in. I told, I told my wife, said, I gotta go in there to make sure Barbara Quackenbush didn't go in first and turn the heat up or the air down or whatever. So I crank it one way. And uh, so uh, we just had about 1,500 students down at Whitefield uh, pack the whole visitor side uh, outside there. And Wayne Campbell from Tyler's Light uh, spoke to our students down there. They walked from the high school and they walked from Wilson Middle School down there. So, uh, you know, still the body temperatures still into that 90 degree uh, heat out there. And so uh, we had a great breakfast this morning, uh, a message from our director of uh, corrections in, in the state of Ohio. And today uh, we have the attorney general's office this afternoon. We have uh, Chief Connell from the Newark City Police Department and some of his folks presenting some, some uh, things. And we also have, and I, and I apologize, uh, Doral. Doral from the dispatch. Is there two writers coming? No, just He's, he did them both. He's going to cover both. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, from the dispatch to talk about, because one of the things that uh, Seth, and it was Seth's idea to include the dispatch in this, and so you advocate folks know that I stuck up for you. Say, hey, what about the advocate? And uh, just kidding, Seth, uh, that way. <laughs> but, uh, but anyhow, um, every day in the news, our news media, whether it be uh, uh, broadcasts or print, something's going on every day. And they're doing a tremendous job of creating what we're trying to do today is create the awareness and start the conversations. Uh, you know, from a school standpoint, we are really looking at helping our kids and helping our families uh, get through some of this, the issues that they're going with. You know, we had, we had talked this morning and things like that. And what I know from our children, you might not be the addict in your family, but all members of the family suffer. All members of the family suffer uh, that way. Brothers and sisters and moms and dads and aunts and uncles and, and those type of things. And so, uh, you know, we have a support group we're starting at the high school uh, for our, our, our students. And then, of course, you know, we talked about our grandparents' support group that we're starting. But, but uh, so those, that's, that's our, our mission here and to strengthen our t ties with our, our businesses and community organizations. So I'm going to lead it off today with Jennifer Lloyd from the Ohio Ter Attorney General's Office, uh, Mike DeWine. And I, I will tell you, Jennifer and uh, Krista Diamond. Uh, Krista is a graduate of Newark, and, and she is a prosecutor uh, in, in this, involved in this fight. Uh, from Aaron graduated from Newark and grew up across from uh, OSU campus there and, and saw his family around and, and that. So, But since minute one of the conversation that we had about starting this, the Attorney General's Office, uh, uh, Jennifer and Krista, what do you need us to do? What can we help you with? And even when Sam had his setback, first call I got was from the Attorney General's, how can we help you? And so we appreciate that. So uh, let's welcome uh, Jennifer Lloyd. I'm not sure how long I'm supposed to talk. What are you giving me? You can talk for hours. Oh, I, I, can, I can talk. I can talk for hours. Thanks for, for uh, everybody for coming here. Um, very impressive uh, breakfast crowd this morning, so thank you for that. 
Um, so my role at the Attorney General's Office is outreach for the state of Ohio, um, which keeps me on the road a lot, um, trying to help wherever we can in communities. Um, when I first spoke to Superintendent, I was so impressed about the uh, grandparents' dinner because we cert we're seeing so much tragedy with children. Um, and it was really important to me. I don't, he doesn't even realize this because I had just kind of been through this pretty awful thing out of Southern Ohio. And so I'm going to actually read to you the email I received. And so I think you'll understand why that you're doing this here was so important to me, um, to the state. Um, you know, our office just gave like $3.4 million to help with families that there's an addiction and with the children because it's, it's a real problem now. And quite frankly, if we don't do something about it, we're raising a generation, our next generation of drug users. If you're a child with even six trauma indicators, you have a greater than 4,000 chance of being an intravenous drug user. Right? So trauma indicators don't have to be like, I was in a burning house. or I mean, they're not as significant as you might think. So what we need a lot more of is kind of this compassion and outreach to people affected, and in particular, many of these children right now. So I was working with a gentleman in, I can try not to say the counties, Southern Ohio, and he had gotten a little frustrated in his county, having a hard time kind of getting everybody together. And he said, all right, I'm gonna go into the next county, and I'm just gonna work as me. I'm not gonna try to do something big, just as me, because we can all make a big difference. So he went to a school, and in that school, 80% um, of their children have parents who are addicted to opiates. 80%. It's a lot, right? So there's tremendous trauma, and there's also a lot of poverty, of course. kind of goes hand in hand. So he's working with them, and... He sends me an email to, let me, to help me understand how bad it is, although I have a pretty good feel for that. And so I'm going to read you a couple of little stories that were sent by children and teachers. And that, but then there is some good news in this, and I'll, and I'll share that with you too, because it shows also the power of press, which is presented to a bunch of people from the press last week saying, please change your story. We need hope. We need recovery. People are getting burnt out of the same thing. People want solutions. Like, can we change the story? So, and Press was engaged in changing this story. So here's the notes. I appreciate the backpack every Friday you give me, but my parents are taking all the food. My parents are on heroin and they buy us nothing. Could you possibly put some underwear in the backpack for me? I've been a whole year without underwear. This is from a boy age 14. And, and so you know, I'm not shaming those addicted. When, when this affects you, the disease of addiction, it is such an effect on your brain that it is the, really the only thing that matters. This is not who these folks are. It is what happens with this drug. A teacher reports to me that a child in fourth grade walked 1.5 miles to, a, to school on a country road in the cold winter because his mother refused to drive him. He had a summer jacket, his hands were ice cold as well as his feet. He had no socks on and had not been fed. His little feet were blistered from the long walk and no socks. A kindergarten teacher told me one of her students had been beaten by his father. His check and chest and back were severely bruised. A student age 17 that had participated in one of our cleanup events was thrown out of his house. His father stated, if you cannot bring money into this house, then you cannot live here. He called the principal, and the principal found a place for him to reside. Four teachers told me about numerous events at their school where the students are not fed, poor personal hygiene, and dirty clothing. Some students wear the same clothes Monday through Friday, and there's a distinct foul odor. Many have not been fed the night before, and they depend on the school for free lunch. Teachers provide baskets on their desks with apples, bananas, and strawberries. So here's what happened. So, so the gentleman who sent me this was very upset when he called me. 
So he calls, that was on a Friday, calls me back on a Monday and said, you're not going to believe what happened. Like, I pretty much believe anything anymore. He said, the newspaper down there wrote a story on it. He said, Jennifer, my phone's been ringing all day with donations. Truckload, honestly, after truckload of donations. Somebody donated to him 1,600 square foot space where they could store all these things and the children could come get them. It changed. And that's the kind of thing, honestly, that's happening in Ohio, and we need more of it because this affects every single one of us. You know, we have very bad numbers. <coughs> They're going to be worse in 16 by quite a bit and, and much worse than 17. Um, a couple of things I want to leave with. Narcan, please get Narcan. You've got folks over here who I know organize free Narcan events. Um, pay attention to those. Get your Narcan. Um, we are very tired. Many people are hearing the let them die. It is compassion fatigue. It's a lot of other reasons. We've got to bring back the faces. And we have to tell stories and we have to fight against that when people are saying that. Get your Narcan. Even if you don't have one in your family, you might. It's good to carry it. We had an overdose. I'm in the Rhodes Tower downtown. We had an overdose outside our building one day. It's, it, I mean, it's everywhere. Um, I see it a lot parking at McDonald's. I, I know somebody's using. The, the biggest problem, what we have now, of course, is the increase in fentanyl and car fentanyl. Um, our numbers, had it not been for that, would actually be down. But because of fentanyl, which is 100 times stronger than morphine, that's now really going to, that's going to take over deaths from heroin. It'll be the number one killer very soon. Um, car fentanyl is a 10,000 times stronger than morphine. So as an example of how serious this is, I did a presentation to libraries. I'm doing one next week to the libraries in the Cleveland area. They are very concerned about, because they're public, the danger in the library. Um, they told me that many people kind of live there. If you've been to the larger public libraries, it's kind of a refuge for homeless and others. Um, so they stay there all day. When they leave, they hide their drugs in books. And then they go to maybe a not safe place. And then they come back and they use in the public bathroom. So if those sorts of drugs are used and someone touches them, you can overdose from that. So they're going to start carrying Narcan. I'm going to check with their attorneys. I can't advise, like, check with your attorneys. But I expect they will. And they do have overdoses in those bathrooms. And they'd had one, one of the libraries had one the week before. So, you know, people who are going into situations where there's drugs really need to get the Narcan for themselves as well as for people around them because these drugs are very dangerous. We, we issued a bulletin to law enforcement, no more field testing of drugs. For that reason, it's just too dangerous. So thank you very much for being here, and I think Chief's up. Oh. oh. Um, I just wanted to um, thank everyone for coming, and uh, we have uh, from the uh, Columbus Dispatch uh, videographer, Doral Chenoweth. Um, this uh, really has been a, a community um, community effort to put all of this together, and, and as soon as uh, the board got out that we were trying to bring um, Sam to the community, I got a call from Ben Schaefer, who is the pastor at the First United Methodist Church downtown, and um, one of the members there is Alan Miller, who's the editor at the Dispatch, and they got me in touch with him, and um, Alan just asked us what, what can they do, and um, he, they did a, um, a great package last fall about addiction in the community, and just here to um, talk a little bit about that. So, Pearl Chenoweth. Thank you very much. Uh, I've been at the Dispatch for 27 years. Uh, is this working? Yes. Five, okay, good. I've been at the Dispatch for 27 years and uh, covered a wide range of issues there. Part of uh, a newsroom now of about 55, 60 people. Uh, and we've been hitting the uh, heroin and opiate problem hard in our, in our coverage. 
Alan Johnson's been writing about it for years, sort of from the state house legislative angle. And then we've got Rita Price and a whole host of reporters uh, looking at it from more of the human side uh, almost seems like every, every week for a while, and now it's almost every day. And about a year ago with the dispatch, we decided to pool our resources and take one concentrated look at the heroin and opiate epidemic in, in Ohio, not just central Ohio. And I caught wind of that and thought, that sounds interesting. That sounds like something I would like to work on. And I went to the editors. I was uh, part of the team. I'm, I've got a lot of experience as a still photographer and a videographer. And I've got a lot of experience sort of working with that population of users. I've, uh, back when crack was really bad, I did a photo essay on some crack users. Uh, this was actually going to be my second go around with uh, the heroin epidemic. Um, and at the dispatch, I, I kind of knew where this was going to go. We had five reporters on this story. We, had, uh, we were going to look at it from many different aspects that included uh, children who are victims of, you know, their parents are addicted, parents who've lost children to heroin, changes in law enforcement with new ways of, of, uh, of you know, finding out you, know, who's, you, know, you don't just arrest um, addicts anymore. You work with them and get them into recovery. We went to recovery centers, including the uh, dark, including a, a big one in the, the Zeff Center in Toledo. Um, and we, there was another day where we looked at uh, addicts, and that's kind of where I came into it. I thought, you know, the the reporter and I, Joanne Viviano, we talked about how do we tell the story of of an addict. And I don't have anybody in my family who's an addict. We wondered how we could go about finding an addict. It's easy to find addicts who are in recovery, who are willing to talk about what they're going through. It's another thing entirely to find somebody who's actively using. And you know, we knew it was bad in the high schools, but I didn't want to go hang out outside of high school and say, you know, I didn't want to deal with anybody under 17 for this project. <laughs> And then I thought, well, you could go hang outside a, a methadone clinic or something, and maybe somebody would relapse. And that just seemed tawdry, and it didn't seem right. And so I knew we had all these other bases covered, you know, all, with all these other reporters. But there was this one part. You know, I needed to find an addict. And how do I do that? And so I, I, there was one day in July last year where I didn't have any assignments. So what do I do when I don't have any assignments? I go to Tommy's Diner in Franklinton. And I sat down and I ate my eggs and I thought, what am I going to do? Today's the day. I feel it. Today is the day. I need to find an addict. I need to start this process. I may fail, but I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it ethically. I'm going to do it the right way, whatever that is. And so over my bacon and eggs, I thought, I'm going to formulate this plan. Every single person I meet I'm going to ask them, I'm going to tell them who I am. I'm Doral Chenoweth. I'm with the dispatch. We're doing a series about heroin. We're looking at recovery centers, police, fire, and EMS. We're looking at all these different aspects of the heroin epidemic. I am looking today for an addict. I'm looking for someone who is actively shooting up. Do you know anybody like that? And that's the key right there. Do you know anybody like that? That's my entry point right there. I wasn't asking you if you're an addict. But, you know, I was getting the ball rolling. And I thought, I'm going to ask every single person I know, or every single person I meet, as soon as I finish my eggs. And so I started with a guy at a booth near me. I made eye contact with him. He didn't know anybody. I, the cashier didn't know anybody. And this is kind of where it gets sad. I walked out on the street, and I go about half a block, and there's a young woman walking toward me. She's about 23, 24, 25 years old. And I gave her my spiel, I'm Doral with the dispatch, I'm looking for an addict, you know anybody like that? And she yells at me, I'm an addict, can't you tell? And I said, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, I didn't know. And she's really mad and she's yelling at me and she's, and I said, I'm so sorry, I didn't look at your veins, I didn't see. And she walked away, still yelling at me and I just kind of swallowed hard and kept going. I go another block. An elderly couple, come, not elderly, a couple comes up to me, just a little older than I am, and, <laughs> and I gave her, her then my spiel, and the woman looks at me and she goes, we don't know anybody that fits your criteria there, but we lost our son to heroin. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm really sorry. And 
so we chatted for a while and then they went their way. So I walk around the corner, tall guy comes up to me and he said, and I give him my spiel, I'm Doral Dispatch. So today I'm looking for an addict. I'm looking for somebody who is actively shooting up. Do you know anybody like that? The guy looks down at me and he goes, well, that'd be me. And I said, really, what are you doing? And he says, well, I'm going to go out and get some cans and I'm going to go get some money for those cans. I'm going to go to my dealer's house. And I'm going to get high. And I said, can I go with you? And he says, yeah, sure. And so it was like we bonded like this. And so I grabbed my bag, and we take off down the alleys of Franklinton. And, you know, I get to know you session. This guy and I, we went to the same high school, Logan High School, a little south of here. Kind of incredible. He's, he's, he's 20 years younger than I am, but still. We bonded. We clicked. And his girlfriend came along for the, uh, to, to go dumpster diving and... Uh, and through a, I, we went a couple of blocks, and I asked him to wear a wireless microphone so I could capture the audio. And then um, I called my reporter, and uh, she comes over, and you know she meets us at a certain alley or whatever, and you know she met up with us. And it was a long day of walking around Franklinton, and here is the story of Adam Conkey and his girlfriend Natasha Long as they kind of go through one day's. Uh, of heroin use. It's about a five minute video. I'm collecting cans, so uh, I can go get me some heroin. I started out smoking pot at first, and then um, we were putting a fence around my brother's trailer, and my brother started on one side, I started on the other, and the guy that did the electricity screwed it up and he made the whole trailer hot so when I touched both sides of the fence together I I made the connection that caused me to get electrocuted and I spent three days in the hospital with a dislocated shoulder and I just loved the Demerol that they gave me and then after I got out of the hospital I got a prescription of Vicodin and then went to Oxycontin and then 30s. And because it was so much cheaper, a buddy of mine introduced me to heroin and I've been doing that ever since because it's a lot cheaper. When we first got together, I had never done anything. My whole family, my mom, my aunts, my uncles, they all grew up on Chicago Avenue in Chicago. And they were all hookers and selling drugs and all that. So I always said my whole entire life that I wouldn't do the same thing. And I was probably about 27 before I started my first drug. And that was with him. Yeah. Uh, what was it? You gave me an Oxycontin? Yep. At first I didn't feel nothing. I said, I don't feel anything. What's with this? Well, he gave me more and I got sick. I was trying to hide it from her, but she got me and my brother and one of his friends snorting one, and I want to try it too, and I told her she didn't want to, and I got me some money, and I'm getting ready to go to my dealer's house and get me some heroin. How do you feel right now? I don't know. Like I'm about to get higher than what I am, I guess. <laughs> so you're high already. Tell me about that. That's just, I don't know, it just... I don't want to say it makes you feel normal, but it just gives me energy and perks me up and makes me happy. I don't like going into drug houses. Nine times out of ten, most of them are very nasty, and it's just, ugh, I just, I don't like it. I'd rather sit out here and wait. He gets mad sometimes because he has to do everything, but I just, I don't see it. Most drug houses around here are just, yeah. We stash our water and our can and our straw right here. Out, this is where we sit. Well, let's put it on there and then cut it in half. Am I going to tell you to take car? Yes. Powder. It's pretty nasty stuff. Well, I try to stay away from the powder stuff because that stuff costs too much money. They want $20 for what you pay for 10 They don't give you nowhere near the amount. Some blankies in there. He has like here. Never seen them before. I just put the water on it and then wait until it dissolves completely and then snort it up my nose. And then it 
it's our turn. But normally we do it here because we don't want to start with it. Here, you go ahead and do it. So. Watch that dude down there loading up that trap. Oh, they're, they're the dudes are the scrapyard dudes. Yeah, I know, but still. They don't do this. Okay, and I put your cigarette out. Oh. Oh, you can light another one. Did you get the cigarette? Yeah, I got it. Oh, okay. Did they ask you for cigarettes? No. And I don't know what it is about the buzz that I get from heroin as opposed to being clean. It just makes you feel more of what you're supposed to be. I mean, I know there's normal, but this makes you feel above and beyond normal. It makes you feel you're, you can do way more than what you can, but what it actually does is it, it, it brain screws you and you overwork yourself. But when you, when you do dope, it makes you, it makes you feel like you're Superman in a sense. I mean, there's not nothing you don't think you can do. We don't do it to where we get right, really high or anything like that. Not crazy. Out and all that. No. It just, there's no sense in doing that. You yeah. waste your buzz, in my opinion. I'd rather just have more energy. Yeah, that's, that's the main reason why I do it. So that way I can work ten times harder. Well, it, it makes me think I'm working ten <laughs> times harder. So I knew that, um, you know, if this problem were so bad as it is, that as a journalist, I would be able to find an addict. And, uh, I, you know, this is what I ended up coming up with. And we ended up using th this couple as the lead in our package of stories in the paper. Um, they're here. We have several hundred copies of this outside, so feel free to take one with you when you leave today. And um, a couple of months went by. This air or this ran in September, and it must have been about two months ago, maybe three months ago. Out of the blue, he calls me. Adam calls me, and he says, "Hey, I'm the guy who, you know you photographed doing heroin." And I said, "Oh yeah, how you doing? Yeah." And we we chat, and he says that he and Natasha are pregnant, and they're going to have a baby. And so the, she was about eight months along at that point. And um, I said, well, you know, a million questions. First of all, is the baby going to be all right? You know, how, how's it going? He goes, oh, baby's going to be fine. He's got a clean bill of health from the doctor. This story actually has a silver lining. Uh, that she was eight months pregnant. And she, they quit using heroin about two months after this video was shot. So I think in September, October, somewhere in there, they quit using because his cousin, who he was very close to, died of a fentanyl overdose. And it so shook Adam, he said, no more. And he basically quit cold turkey. And shortly thereafter, Natasha quit cold turkey as well. And she also found out she was pregnant about that same time. So they are now clean. Uh, the baby has been born. The baby's name is Asher which is a biblical name. There's a tribe in the Bible. And I said, well, who's Asher in the Bible? And Adam told me it's a tribe. I said, okay, it's good. And they're living on the south side of Columbus with his father. And it's not an easy path for him, but they are, she is taking advantage of all the services that she can, you know, for, from uh, different agencies and, and doctors and things like that. And so they have a happy, healthy baby boy now together, which I actually... And I thought, if we're going to show them on page one doing this, and they have turned their life around, we owe it to them again to put them on page one when they've got some good news to report. And so I went down and did this video, which rehashes a little bit of the first one, but it gets into their new life together. Let me turn this one off. Sure. Okay. Pretty nasty stuff. You're just a slave to that stuff. You do what you normally wouldn't do to get whatever you want. I was addicted to everything. Alcohol, I mean, like, heroin was my main thing, though. It's just a bad life to live. And you can live better and do better if you really want to quit. Well, his name is Asher Curry.
Jared is Conky, and I, all my kids have their names the say for one, and um, I like to keep the names biblical also. So Asher's like a, a tribe of, of Israelites. When you have boys, watch out, they pee everywhere as soon as you take the diaper off. <laughs> so yes, this blue pad is for when he pees, I don't want to worry about all my stuff getting soaking wet. <laughs> I was praying, you know, that my baby would come out okay, which he did. He was only six, one of my other kids were eight pounds, but he was healthy and there was nothing wrong with him, so. A lot of people do get high again, but when you've done it for as long as I have and you get sick of it and then, you know, not only family members, but I've had a lot of friends die from that. I mean, it's just, no, I'm not. That's just not, not, not on the table anymore. I'm not going to go back to having to work just to get high again. Instead of having money in my pocket to go buy things that I want to buy. And, you know, plus I got the little one now, so he's going to be my big money spender there. <laughs> you know, to see him grow and just looking and seeing him and just knowing that, you know, I've got to do something for my baby. It's more important than doing drugs. <coughs> and I look forward to seeing him grow up, too. That's going to be cool. I wish I had brought a copy of them. They were on page one holding their baby. It's really sweet. Any questions? agreed that they snorted heroin rather than injected it and they they say it's easier to get off of it because of that whether that's true or not I'm sure there's a lot of experts in this room who can either confirm or deny that I'm not sure but that's one of the things that they said certainly worked for them so yeah I'm glad it has. thank you so much for your time that was a good thing I missed that last thanks Okay, uh, now we have uh, Chief uh, Connell from, from the Newark City Police Department uh, present some things, and I don't know you guys, you'll touch on I got out of way. <laughs> All right, I've got a big mouth, and I tend to talk too long, so I've got a plant in the room that's going to cut me off when I talk too long. So if, if everybody can hear me, they can get rid of this thing. And I'll forewarn you that I don't speak as well as the uh, previous gentleman, and I didn't do any video. So, um, my name is Barry Connell. I, I became the chief, the interim chief of Newark in uh, March 2015. Um, spent a majority of my career just on normal police work. But one of the things that I did a lot of my career was police dogs. So, from about 1992 on, uh, my job was was training police dogs to find exactly what we're talking about here. So, my whole career had been based in enforcement, you know, the, that side of, of the addiction issues. Um, however, um, like most people in police work, I had a, a life before um, police work that uh, was different. I was in the Coast Guard, I was stationed in Maryland, and I sometimes ask this question, and I, and I ask for a raise of hands of anybody who is affected by addiction. However, I won't bother doing that here, since probably you're all here for a particular reason and you would most likely raise your hand. But one of the things that strikes people odd when I talk about our program is that most all of us, whether we want to admit it or not, in some extended part of our family, friends, our network, there's a face to addiction. Um, it's not, a, it's not a, an entity in and of itself that doesn't include human face. And this is mine. Um, this is a, a young man who um, started on crack cocaine at about 16 years old, spent about the next 20 years in and out, in and out of rehabs, a lot of different places. Um, I am personally very thankful that this is him now. Um, gained a lot of weight after he quit uh, using drugs, but uh, he's a, a good member of his community in Crystal, Maryland. 
works on the water. They have a distinctive little um, spiel. This is actually my brother-in-law. And part of my story that I tell is that uh, my wife and I actually financed my brother's, my brother-in-law's drug habit when he got started. Um, he, he's continuing to do what he started with. When he was 16, my wife and I co-signed a loan for him to buy a boat and crab pots, which are the little uh, chicken wire boxes that they catch blue crabs in, and boat motor and these crab pots. So. Um, Soft crabs are a delicacy. They sell them all over the world. And he made $15,000 in three weeks. Um, there was a particular run. And can you imagine what a 16-year-old does with $15,000? I would have spent it on cars and parts, but, but he didn't. So this is my story. Um, so I, I went to a timeline of things um, for us. And I'll talk about the, the Newark Addiction Recovery Initiative that we started and my partners in crime over here, Officer Trent Stanford. At least acknowledge himself. <laughs> Colleen Richards. And <laughs> um, they, they do all the work. I just get to speak. So in June, early June of 2015, like I say I've been a police chief just a couple of months. Um, still very wet behind the ears, probably still am. I saw on a police blog that the Gloucester, Massachusetts police chief, made an announcement that if you were an addict and you were ready for help, you had to be ready, that was the key, come to the police department and that police department would find you help. And I remember you know, I was sitting at home, I could tell you exactly where I was, and I can tell you exactly what time it was. The, the news was on. I was watching out. I was playing on the computer. And I read that. And I said out loud to myself, this guy's either a complete idiot or he's a genius. I'm not sure which he is. But time will tell. So I wanted to follow this story. So I became intrigued by that story. Kept, I, I you know, followed their police department, their, the Perry organization. Um, June 16th was my birthday. You guys didn't even bring me a present, I think. I met with Colleen and Patricia about some projects they were working on, including the Fed Up Rally that they were going to do in downtown Newark. And they knew I was a, a rookie police chief, and I think they took me as an easy mark to, to kind of push me around and have me do the things they wanted me to do. I nearly stood them up. Luckily for me, I double booked meetings in the exact same place. And they're like, you know you're supposed to be meeting with us, right? So we talked. And they, they talked about different initiatives. So the police, uh, same day, ironically, the Police Assisted Re Addiction Recovery Initiative, Perry, out of Massachusetts was formed to back up agencies that do things similar to what we do. We gotta tell you, in 27 years of policing, this is not what cops are supposed to do. Touchy feely things, all of that stuff. We're supposed to arrest bad guys. We're supposed to put them in jail if they're dealing drugs, if they're using drugs, all the same thing. However, we found that our war on drugs, it only attacked on one side, is not effective. It has to be attacked on all sides. So we looked into some other things. Um, we started building relationships, and, and I'll tell you that in our community, um, Jennifer, you, you've been made aware of this, I know, and for anybody else that's not in our area, uh, we have some great organizations in Lincoln County. Um, I went to high school with Rob Montagnes. Um, Lou signed probably both of our graduation uh, certificates way back when. But set up a meeting with Lincoln Memorial Health Systems and told them, here's what we're thinking about doing, similar to Gloucester's program. Are you willing to help us? Sure. They didn't even hesitate. Sure. What do you need? I said, well, from what I've learned so far, and I've done a lot of Google searching because there's a lot of things about addiction I didn't know. So Google became my friend. So we found out that access to treatment is a huge barrier. And what we found practically is there is a lot of barrier to treatment depending on what your insurance situation is. We, we never see headlines about rich people that can't get into treatment. We see that they do make treatments. So that isn't a problem. June 17th, we announced that we were going to start the Newark the Mary program. It's too hard to say. So uh, we made that announcement. We invited the media to uh, the event that we hosted. And uh, my, my partners in crime, well, Trent wasn't on board yet. 
Um, but we announced that we were going to do this. Caught some flack, you know. I've heard the stories about the let them die, the you know whatever, whatever. However, I always think back to my face, <coughs> and it would have bothered me had he passed away. I, I love my brother-in-law dearly, so I'm not interested in that aspect of it. And what I want to also say is that nothing about the Newark Division of Police has become soft on crime. And I've said this every time. These guys are sick of hearing me saying it. If you are profiting off the suffering of human beings and their misery, the North Division of Police and our partner agencies, the Central High Drug Enforcement Task Force, that they'll have a table set up tonight at the other event, nothing changes if you are profiting off the, the misery of human beings. We're still coming after you as hard as we possibly can. None of that changes. However, if you are an addict, and you are ready for treatment, you're ready to get clean, you're ready to make your life better, show up at the police department. And one of the things that seems so odd about this entire situation is, what's one thing that drug users know? One thing. They know where the cops are. They spend all their time trying to avoid it. So in order to avoid something, you need to know where it's at. So you know where the police department's at, you can show up there and we'll try to get you help. We knew that we'd have a, a little bit of a rough start because it would probably seem like the hey, come down to the warehouse and pick up your free refrigerator and then we'll arrest you on your outstanding warrant. We knew that that would be the case. Um, Holly, um, I've known for a long time, said that the rumor actually went through the Lincoln County Jail. And it's a new new program North's doing to trick you into coming down and get arrested for drugs. Whatever, we knew we'd have to weather that storm. Well. I didn't realize that the storm would only last from Friday when we announced the program till Monday. We had our first people walk in the door on Monday. So we started rather quickly um, and, and overwhelmingly the people who walk in the door say, this is all. In fact, you probably hear it every time that somebody comes in, this is all. Coming to the police for help. And again, if we're out of the business in two years, that's fine by me. We can close up shop on the deal. and. and other, other entities can take over. But for right now, we want to help from this side of it. We still do the other part of it. We still work on the enforcement side. But this is our way of helping with this crisis. Um, everybody's affected by it. So, um, as of April 24th, we had had 77 people come through our doorway. Um, Um, I helped out the first couple weeks and one of the captains did, but uh, they've done all the legwork on that. Now, I can tell you, nobody's going to be shocked in the room to, to hear that a lot of them have relapsed. But I know for a fact, on one, actually we just got a letter and a voicemail from one who's doing very, very well. But if nothing else, we know for a fact we saved one person's life. One person told us uh, a week or so later, I can't remember. Was. They had actually went out to a store, purchased rope, had actually formed a noose, and had actually strung it up because they were done with addiction one way or the other. They chose to walk in our door and didn't have to hang themselves. So if nothing else, we know for a fact we saved one life. So the other advantage is for everybody who's a Newark resident, a Newark taxpayer, we haven't spent a dime of your money on this program, not one dime. Everything that we do is, is uh, funded. I know that there's some fundraisers from other agencies that want to try to help us on transportation costs, should we need them, things like that. And you could even argue that having Trent sitting here is a cost, but it's not. We got a grant for two community initiatives officers, the federal government, which you're a taxpayer, I get that. But the federal government's paying us to have two officers in our department to do these community outreach type things, things to work on trust building with the community. And if we can get addicts to trust cops, well, that's a pretty good measure, I would say. So everything, you, you've all got a pamphlet there. Uh, please hand them out. This is the, this is all stuff that's on there. Um, there is one part of our program that we're working out. We're going to try to work out the logistics on it. I know it's, it's been a bit of a controversy throughout the country and agencies that do it. Um, we have said 
that if you have drugs and you want to get rid of them, bring them to the police department with you, we won't charge you with them criminally. Um, we, we do have a new prosecutor now, and we're working that out um, because I never want to step on the toes of, of the partners that are working with us. Um, I will use the analogy, though, that, and I use my poor, my poor dad, he gets used in this example all the time. My dad's 74 years old. If he were walking down the sidewalk in front of the Northern Division of Police, and he looks down and he sees a heroin needle laying on the sidewalk, and he, being a good citizen like my dad is, he'd pick that thing up and he'd walk right into the police department to the lobby and say, hey, I don't want any little kids getting a hold of this. Can you get rid of this? Judge, you'll confirm. Technically, he committed a felony. He possessed heroin. I, I don't think you'd find a prosecutor, a cop, or a judge in the world that would say, you need to go to jail for that. So there is discretion in the law, and we're hoping that we can get some things put into legislation to allow for this. Now, what I've been told is heroin addicts don't have any leftovers. So they generally won't bring anything to you other than maybe their rig. So uh, that's the things we're working out. Um, and I'm not going to bore you with all the rest of this. It's all in the, the pamphlet that Trent handed out to everybody. Um, I, I will talk about this. What we don't do is if anybody comes in, we don't question them about, you know, who's your source, where are you buying from, anything like that. Do you want to you wanna work for us? you want to be an undercover? It's off limits. That's why we have a separate person doing it from somebody who conducts, conducts investigations. You walk in, you get to walk back out if you want to. However, what we have found is that it's, it's almost like a coming clean type of thing when somebody is ready for help. They really tell us a lot of things. Now, we're not writing it all down and going out. But it's good for them to kind of be able to talk about those things to help them move on from where they were. Um, it's designed for Lincoln County residents. Uh, I know Gloucester kind of shot themselves in the foot when they announced their program. They had people come from as far away as California. Um, knowing that, that I have with, with LAP and LMH and Shepherd Hill and, and all the local organizations, the other organizations that help us out, I don't want to overload resources bringing people in that aren't from Lincoln County. So it's designed for Lincoln County residents. Um, there are disclaimers. Um, we went based off of what some of the other departments that have done um, with theirs. There are some disclaimers about people who cannot enter our program due to obvious reasons in some and, and not so obvious in others. But supervisors can always override that. Um, we always, you know, if you have outstanding warrants, if you have felony drug trafficking convictions, um, I know a couple of times we've had people who are on probation and we've gotten clearances from the judges and, and probation officers on, on trying to get them into treatment or, or you know, putting off a court date, something like that. Obviously, we want to work within the, the criminal justice system and not break any rules because I really don't like, and I, I see two of them, I really don't like making judges mad. It's not good for me. So, um, so we do have those disqualifiers. And then uh, we have, there's our number if anybody wants to take it down. Um, Trent is the go-to guy for anything uh, you need on the program. Um, he's pretty much handling it every once in a while. He comes up with a question and they design the flyer and the whole nine yards. So with that, I won't keep boring you. I'll ask you if you have any questions about our program. What's the roles? There are volunteers. Um, actually, uh, they sit uh, a lot of times if there's a, a hospital stay, you know, if they need to be seen at the ER. Or, um, sometimes it takes us a while. You'd be surprised how I need treatment. Well, that isn't as quick as, well, come right on in and we'll get to it. So there's, there's a lot of downtime, and we all know, I would say everybody in the room knows that the most dangerous time is from when the person says, I'm ready for help, till they say, yeah, I'm not ready anymore. I'm out. So we want to we wanna have somebody there talking to them, kind of helping them out of that. So, yeah. of, of the 74, did you see a uh, 75? Did you see a uh, big push at the beginning, or has it been kind of steady? Um, we got hit pretty hard, and then we've, we've had a couple of spurts. We had, what, 15 in five days, I think. Um, and then, then we'll go a little while without it. I don't know if there's a rhyme or reason we haven't figured anything out. Um, overdose deaths tend to cause it to go up and down. Both. We've seen it all back up. 
I didn't know this, but uh, talking to uh, the lady who helped us get started with this as an addict, that actually overdose deaths increase sales for drug dealers. It's a pretty crappy way of looking at it, but yeah, it's, they don't mind if somebody dies. <laughs> is, that, is that my time? I'm going to shut up? <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, sir. Average age? Okay. Mid-20s. Mid-20s. I don't think we've had a juvenile yet. Oh, no. <coughs> and I don't think we've had a juvenile yet. Which I guess it's good. Uh, you look at it. Yes, ma'am. Are you hearing about the juvenile Oh, we, for the last 27 years. Okay. So, it's there. That I've been caught. Yeah. We, we know it exists. <coughs> It's, it's a sad fact, and, and I would say in today's age, that they probably are up to speed quicker than they were. If I can add to that, the, um, the big thing with the younger ones tends to be pills, but then they'll transition to heroin. But I think the average age of first use of prescription pills in Ohio is 14. Mm -hmm. Just based on our questions that we ask, I'm getting a lot of 13 to 14. Yeah. We do ask, we ask background checks on our intake, you know, just to kind of learn how the path got started. You know, I, I got to admit at one point in my life, I, I thought that in my, in my career that, you know, if you use drugs, it's all about bad choices and you just started that way. And I know statistics probably, I don't know what statistics show, but I can tell you probably in Newark, in my opinion, probably well over half got started to or through otherwise normally legal pills. Alright, I'll shut up. Oh, no. oh, I almost. <laughs> <laughs> Darn it. If, you know, if a child is like an, an adult, per se, and how difficult is it for the parent of that young adult to get guardianship over that child because of the decisions that they're making? Uh, that's kind of the last question I'm not going to ask. Yeah. Uh, there, there's probably support group people here that can probably get with you on a break or something to tell you. I, legally, I don't know. Uh, and juveniles can't enter our program. We just we have to have a, a legal custodian and the parent has to you know. We just can't take them to the program and send them to us for legal. I don't know if Judge Grant still works. Judge Marceline back there. I don't know if you're having a, is that something for you guys to address, maybe? Oh, that's a, no, we have a, okay. Do you know that? Is Judge Hubert? Well, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, 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 so we, we appreciate how much you I don't know is uh, uh, somebody from our C's group here uh, you know we, we track what we're you know what we're talking to our students about uh, because we want to know that and I don't know more if you want to address our kids talking about that you know um, yeah there, there's that's that is one of the categories that we do have in there um, there's probably a lot that is tracked and we do have, um, it's mostly, I think middle school and high school is where we're seeing those kids come into the office talking to their, their, school, or their, to their um, school counselor or whatever, but that, that is something that's on the radar that yes, kids are talking about it. Yeah. You know, one, one of our goals here in the district is to create that support group and outlets for our students. Uh, and it does, it did today, I felt as I was thanking Wayne Campbell at the football field today, uh, the stadium, with 1,500 up there, and you go out there, of course, you know there's a little, a little buzz.
of the two times in the last month I've been in front of them, students and a group of them talking about, you may not be an addict, but do you know somebody? Do you? It gets really quiet. And that tells me, you know, on that, on that radar of saying, hey, they're paying attention, they're hearing back. And that's an issue uh, that I can tell from the last the two times here in a month that, that uh, we've had that discussion. So, uh, in any event, uh, good, good stuff. We appreciate so much your, your work and information. And, uh, Dr. Hurst has arrived. We got you, Doctor. Don't worry about that, man. <laughs> Throw the things at the judge when you walk yeah. in the door. <laughs> and even, even worse, being from the Scanes County in Zanesville, doing that in Newark is not a good thing. <laughs> not a good thing at all. They just asked if I need any help. I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take care of it. Uh, okay, I'll let you go ahead. My problem is still alive. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. It's so wonderful to see you here this afternoon. My name is Kay Spurgel. I am the Executive Director of the Mental Health and Recovery Board for Lincoln and Knox County. And it's really, really my true honor and delight to introduce our next speaker, who's Dr. Mark Hurst, who I might add, I have worked with and known for the past 20 years of my professional life. Um, he currently is serving as the medical director for the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. And Mark, are you also still the interim director for the Department of Health as well? Yes. He's also the medical director of the Ohio Department of Health as well. So let me give you a little bit of background on Dr. Hurst here. He's a native of Zanesville. He was the 1981 class of valedictorian at Muskingum College in New Concord. He graduated from the Medical College of Ohio at Toledo in 1985. He completed residency training at the University of Michigan and, the, and at the Ohio State University. He's board certified in psychiatry and addiction psychiatry, and he's been recognized as one of the best doctors in America since 1995. I can only that. <laughs> In 1993, working for Twin Valley Psychiatric Center, which is located in Columbus, Ohio. While there, he was the Assistant Chief Clinical Officer for Addiction Psychiatry, as well as the Chief Clinical Officer beginning in 2008. Um, he's prior to his career with the state, he has held leadership positions in psychiatry and addiction psychiatry in the VA health system, at Harding Hospital, and at the Ohio State University, where he still remains an active clinical faculty. And he does many different things at the state of Ohio. One of the most wonderful things I can do with Dr. Hurst is coming into communities and explaining the complexity of opiates to all of us and helping us understand some pathways to begin to address this issue. So without further ado, Dr. Hurst. Thank you. That would probably, unless people, can people hear me okay if I just talk here in the back? Can you hear me okay? If you don't mind, I'd just as lean go without, the, without this. So, uh, um, thanks so much for inviting me. I, tomorrow night, <laughs> tomorrow night, I'm uh, going to Zanesville to talk. And I'm going to give them a hard time, because I'm from Zanesville originally, as, as uh, Kay mentioned. And I've been invited to Newark a lot of times in the past five years since I've been medical director. You know how many times I've been invited to Zanesville? <laughs> Once. <laughs> Tomorrow night is the first time, so I'm going to give them a hard time about that. So anyhow, thank you for inviting me. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Kay. And thanks for the work that everybody's doing in their communities, uh, in, in, your, in your community at this point. This is a, a vaccine and difficult problem that we're facing in terms of the opioid epidemic in Ohio. And as Kay mentioned, um, one of the, this isn't gonna collapse on me, is it? Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, right now I'm also the interim medical director of the Department of Ohio Department of Health. And outside my office there, there's this picture. And it goes back 100 years. 100 years ago, there was a flu epidemic that was worldwide. And Ohio was no exception to that. And it talks about the 1917-18 flu pandemic, which affected uh, over a million Ohioans and resulted in 8,602 deaths in Ohio. Last year in Ohio, we lost 3,000, not last year, 
2015, so last year we have information for, we lost 3,005 individuals due to accidental overdoses, almost all of whom were uh, opioid overdoses. So this really is an issue of, of, uh, of epidemic proportions, and it requires a public health approach that looks not only one, on one facet of this. Treatment is very important, very important part of this, but treatment's not all of the answer. Prevention is an important part of that, having life-saving measures, intervening early, but having a community response is equally important. And when we have faced other epidemics in our country, the way that we have been successful in dealing with them is by a public commitment and good science. We have both of those, I think, and that's something that's gonna help us turn this around. I, I wish I could tell you that it's gonna turn around in May of 2017. I can't tell you that. What I can tell you is that by using what we know works, it is going to turn around eventually. But that requires the commitments of everybody. The medical community, the community as a whole, the law enforcement community, educators, it really requires all of us to do our best as we can with this and to collaborate genuinely. When things like this happen, there's a tendency for us to get anger, angry and to point fingers and to see that it's, uh, you know, somebody else needs to get on the stick and get this taken care of. And we all need to get on the stick. You know, it's like the thing that all of our teachers told us, right? You know, when you point a finger at somebody, three are pointing back at you. Uh, you know, we need to take that to heart and realize that all of us have a role in this. And hopefully I'll talk a little bit uh, about this as we go on. So the first thing that I want to mention is that when a person updates their slides, the first slide they should update is the title slide. <laughs> and they should change the date on the title slide, which I did not do. So how big a problem uh, are opiates and is addiction in the United States? It's, it's still a big problem. Uh, so in this year of 2014, which is the last year we have good national data for it, about 21 million people were affected by some kind of substance use disorder in our country. Uh, and of those, the majority by far had an alcohol use disorder or alcoholism. Sometimes when, you know, my job now seems like it's opioids all day, all the time, I wonder what happened to alcoholism. But alcoholism didn't go away. Uh, it's still out there. Uh, and it's still very problematic for us. But opioids are our biggest, are our second biggest killer, or third biggest killer, actually, among drugs of abuse. What's the number one killer among drugs of addiction? Everybody's saying alcohol. No, it's not alcohol. <coughs> Tobacco. Yep, there you go. Yeah, nicotine is the number one killer. So we still lose about 400,000 people in the United States every year due to, uh, due to tobacco use from cardiac disease, lung cancer, things like that. Uh, but losing 3,000 people in Ohio to opioids is pretty dramatic, too. Okay, so of those seeking treatment, uh, or of those who have a problem, how many get treatment? Um, perhaps 20%, although that may be a little bit elevated, more like 10% actually, uh, uh, actually want to seek treatment. And about 80% don't feel that they have a problem and don't seek treatment with that. So that's an intervention point for us. We can throw up our hands in the air and say, well, if you don't want treatment, you're not ready for treatment. But there are techniques that you can use that can kind of help people recognize that there may be an issue and start getting them to think about there being a problem. So again, most people don't feel they need treatment. Some people uh, feel that they do need treatment, but they don't try to make an effort to get treatment. Uh, and then the rest of them do try to do try to get treatment. So of those people who don't get treatment but feel they have a problem, why don't they get treatment? The main reason is still they aren't ready to stop using. So these are people who say, yes, I got a problem, but I'm just not ready to quit using it. And often it's a consequence <coughs> that leads someone to think it's time to get treatment. Nobody continues to use drugs, alcohol, or anything else because their using career is going so particularly well. People get into treatment, people change their behavior because they recognize that there is a problem with it. And usually that's because of something outside them. There's an arrest, there's a divorce, there's a loss of a job. There's something that kind of gets attention at that point. 
which is a real important point for us to try to get people into treatment uh, because that, that change motivator, as we call it, the business, is something that can go away fairly quickly and you can start to convince yourself that uh, it really wasn't uh, part of my using that led me to do that. The second biggest reason is no health care coverage or couldn't afford the cost of treatment. Third is that it might have a negative effect on, on the job, and the fourth is that people just didn't know where to go to treatment. So when we look at these, we see that there are things that we can do with all of these. Things called motivational interviewing to help people who don't quite get to they're ready to stop using. We have expanded Medicaid in Ohio, so that helps more people have health care coverage with it. Having a negative effect on the job is something that we really need to work with employers on. Uh, actually, uh, you should probably be less concerned about a person who has a history of addiction and it is, and it is in recovery than a person who has a history of addiction and is not in recovery. Uh, so that's something that could be really helpful. And there's nothing that's more helpful in terms of treatment and having a supportive family and having a job and having things that help you move on with your life. People frequently get into treatment because they fear something. They fear they're going to lose a relationship. They fear they're going to end up in jail or something like that. That doesn't keep people in recovery. What keeps people in recovery is hope. It's the hope that life can get better. And things like having a job and having stable relationships contribute to that hope. And not knowing, not knowing where to go for treatment, that's something that we can deal with, too, by a variety of different ways. So then we get to this, well, what are these things that we call addiction? Well, we remember this commercial from the 1970s, right? Some of us do. Some of us weren't even born in the 1970s, right? Yeah, I, I get it. And we all thought this was really cool. The skillet, you know, this is drugs. And then the egg cracks and it sizzles. This is your brain on drugs. I don't know that it ever helped anybody not use drugs, but it was pretty cool. But in fact, this is what your brain is on drugs. So this is information we didn't have in the 1970s, but it's come in the 1990s and the 2000s and things like that, that we know drugs impact the brain and they impact specific areas of the brain. And that's what makes them addictive or not addictive drugs. Addictive drugs are going to have an effect at certain brain centers. Drugs that aren't addictive are not gonna have it. So being a brain disease, there's certain things associated with the disease. If we have the disease of pneumonia, there are certain things that are associated with that, right? You have a cough, you have a fever, you bring up some sputum, you feel tired, you feel awful. You know, those are the kind of things you see. Addiction has those symptoms too. Things like compulsive behavior and craving for the drug. If you don't have an addiction, you don't have a craving for a drug. If you do have an addiction, that drug is the same as food or water or anything else that's required for your survival in terms of your brain's reaction to it. Continuing to use drugs despite problems that are caused by the drugs. <coughs> so if, you know, for instance, after I'm done here, I go down to the bar and I have a, have a few drinks or a few too many drinks, and, you know, I'm driving and the, the chief says, there's something wrong there, and he pulls me over and I get picked up for driving uh, under the influence. It would not be a good thing for my career, it would not be a good thing for my marriage, it wouldn't be a good thing for a lot of things. If I'm not alcoholic or addicted, I'm going to say, I'm never doing this again. And I'm going to be successful at doing that. On the other hand, if I do have addiction, I may say, I'm never going to do this again, but I do it again, and I do it again, and I do it again, which is part of the disease itself. And then persistent changes in the brain structure and function are a really important part of it. So, what is this? It's a brain, right? You know, it's a graphic representation of the brain. It's not really a brain. It's a picture of the brain. But, uh, yeah, that, that, this is what the human brain looks like. And I just did something I probably shouldn't have done. Okay, let get back to that. And that's where it acts. So when we, when we see certain things in terms of drugs of abuse, where, they, where those drugs bind in the brain tells us something about how they work. But any drug that can cause addiction is going to bind in this reward center. 
of the ventral, the nucleus accumbens and ventral tegmental area. There won't be a quiz after this or anything like that. But these are the same areas that are activated in terms of food, in terms of sex, in terms of other things that we need to do that we find enjoyable or important uh, for our species continuing. So I don't care whether you're talking about opioids, cocaine, alcohol, tobacco, or marijuana, all of them are going to have an effect right in those particular areas. And as they have those effects, they start us thinking in ways that would be better not to think. So we experience these drugs, they make us feel in a certain way, and then our brain thinks, we've got to have this, we've got to have it, we've got to have it, which is not the way that a person who's not addicted responds to it. And on another level, uh, what happens is, this would be a normal nerve cell, or a graphic representation of a normal nerve cell, where we have this brain chemical called dopamine, which is really one of the feel-good chemicals. There's a lot more to it than that, but, but that's what it is. And when a nerve impulse occurs, this dopamine is released, and it has an effect here on a second nerve cell. But when we add a drug that causes addiction to this, and what happens is we get a heck of a lot more dopamine in here than we have on a regular basis. And that's what gives it its reinforcing effects to use again and again. So if we see a drug like cocaine impacts these two brain centers. They impact that brain center, as I mentioned, just like food and water, but more intense. And that's why when folks get into recovery, the usual things that we did that gave us pleasure pale in comparison to the kind of pleasure that is experienced by these particular drugs. It's an artificial kind of stimulation of this. So things like having relationships, going bowling, uh, eating, things like that, just don't have the same luster that they did before using the drug. And it takes a while for that to regenerate to the point where, yes, they are as enjoyable and they help with a life recovery. So this is where it all gets started. This is, uh, these are poppies. I grow them in my yard. Probably a lot of us grow them in our yards. Um, and they'll be blooming here in probably about another month or six weeks or so. Very pretty flowers. They last barely a week. Uh, if you get a rainstorm, they don't even last that long, do they? But then after the leaves fall off, you're left with this ugly green bulb. It's ugly to us, to the eye. But when you break that bulb off, it leaks this rubbery resin kind of substance. And that rubbery res resin, resin is what contains uh, the opioids, where you can get heroin, where you can get morphine, where you can get codeine, uh, and, things that, and things of that nature. I would advise that you not do that with the poppies that you grow in your yard. Uh, you, know, it, it, you don't want the chief coming to your house and saying, what are you doing with, the, you know, with these poppies? But that's where you get it. In fact, you wouldn't be able to get enough out of them in your yard anyhow. But you see fields and fields of these growing in certain parts of, of the world, and that's where they extract it from. So it's really, really pretty. And in The Wizard of Oz, a lot of us remember this, Dorothy and her companions see the Emerald City, they're on their way to the Emerald City, everything's going to be great. And the Wicked Witch has this field of poppies that are filled with opium kind of compounds that block their way there. It's almost like a metaphor of what's actually happening, isn't it? And they go through here, and what happens? They fall asleep, which is one of the things that opioids do. They're sedating. People fall asleep. They get comatose, and in fact, they can die from the overdoses. So those were pretty, but this isn't so pretty. Edgar Allan Poe, who was both alcoholic and addicted to opium. John Belushi, who died in the 1980s from an overdose of a speedball, which is a combination of heroin and cocaine, which is something that we're seeing again. Philip Seymour Hoffman died from, with a needle in his arm a few years ago. And then last year, Prince died from an overdose of fentanyl, which we've seen more and more of in Ohio over about the past <coughs> three to four years uh, also. So these opioids work exactly in a little different mechanism, but with the same net effect. This is a normal opioid type brain cell. But as the opioid comes in, we see more dopamine and it activates those same reward centers. So it is a very addictive drug. So what do we know about these addictive drugs? They all work on our endogenous neurotransmitter system. So 
are internal uh, <coughs> biological brain chemicals, and they mimic their activities. They all have effects on these biological reward centers. They're the same areas that are required for survival. So basically, they're tricking us into thinking that their use is necessary for survival. And of course, nothing's farther from the truth. The use of them does not help with survival. The use of them makes it less likely that we're going to be able to survive. <coughs> but at the same time, we need to keep in mind, not everybody who uses becomes addicted, right? I mean, most of us have probably been exposed to an opioid medication at some time in our life. We've had an injury, we've had surgery, we've had something like that, and very few of us are actually addicted to opioids. So it's not just about using it, it's about the brain's response to it. And the difference in the brain of an individual who has an addiction and the in brain of an individual who does not have addiction. And we see those things I talked about earlier that only become manifest in somebody who has that addiction. The craving, the not being able to control use, so you intend to use just a little bit, it gets out of control. The urge to use it again and again. Spending lots of time making sure you have the drug, using the drug, recovering from the effects of it continuing to use and things like that. So where does this come from? Well, genetics is a big part of it. If you have a first degree relative, meaning a father, mother, sister, brother, son or daughter who has addiction, your rate is gonna be substantially increased. And we know genetics is important. We know genetics is not all of the story, but it's important. We can't change what our genetics are. But there are other things that act on those genetics that we can deal with and are helpful for prevention. Environment and early life experiences do have something to do with this. First, the exposure to potentially addictive substances. If you're never exposed to an addictive substance, you're not gonna become addicted to an addictive substance, right? But the other piece of that is, the earlier in life you are exposed to an addictive substance, the more likely it is that you will become addicted to it which is why it is very important for us to delay that as long as possible. A person who starts to smoke marijuana when they're 12 years old is much more likely to become addicted than a person who starts smoking marijuana when they're 19 years old. True for alcohol, true for opioids, true for all drugs of abuse. So eliminating or delaying that is important. Early life trauma. And this is something that affects so many different things. We all know that how life starts out does have something to do with how life ends up. And if life doesn't start out particularly well, life frequently doesn't end up particularly well. The more different kinds of, an, of abuse or neglect that a person experiences before age 18, the more likely they are to have an addictive disorder. In fact, if a man has had six different kinds of abuse or neglect that he experienced, he is 46 times more likely to use intravenous drugs than a person who has had none of those. That's a pretty profound thing. So prevention of abuse and neglect and dealing with it early on is something that could really have an effect. And life stress in general. Uh, individuals frequently turn <coughs> to different substances to help cope with life stress. It's not an especially good way to do it. Uh, it's not a, a particularly effective way to do it, but it does happen. And then other things like mental illness and potency of the addictive drug. The more potent the drug is, the more likely it is someone is going to become addicted to it. That's why a drug like fentanyl, which is extremely potent, is much more likely to be addictive than a less potent kind of opioid. So, this is not only a brain disease, this is a chronic brain disease, which is not always the way we've thought about it, nor always the way that we've treated it. So what are the characteristics of chronic diseases? And we can all think of chronic diseases, like uh, diabetes, things of that nature. It causes disorder functioning of part of the body for one or more causes. Fits for addiction, right? Disorder functioning of the brain occurs over a long period or recurs. And this is something that we have not always captured in terms of addiction and addiction treatment. Our traditional model for this was that a person goes to treatment, they then go to AA, and they're then going to do well. This is a disease that has a propensity for relapse. So when relapse occurs, 
We need to understand that as part of the disease and a reason for us to change our treatment plan with it. It has characteristic symptoms, signs, it follows a predictable course, we know about outcomes, and it has certain treatments with it. So if we compare this to something we would all agree is a chronic disease like cardiac disease, does it really fit? I think so. So if we look at the symptoms, if you have cardiac disease, what kind of things do you experience? You feel weak, you feel short of breath when you start exercising, and you may have some chest pain with that. Does addiction have certain symptoms with it? Symptoms meaning that things that someone is going to complain about. And the answer to that is absolutely. Craving for the drug, that inability to control use, consequences of use, and so on and so forth. Uh, however, the person who has addiction usually doesn't come to the doctor and complain about these things, right? You don't go to the doctor and say, doctor, you know, I just have this craving for these opiates and I think we need to do something about that. No. What do people complain about when they have addiction, when they go to see the doctor? Marital problems. Can't sleep. Feeling depressed. Things like that. We only detect these symptoms if we start asking about them. What about the signs? So signs are things that a doctor, nurse practitioner can, uh, can see or measure. So with cardiac, we see problems with an electrocardiogram, stress tests, things like that. With addiction, we see the same kind of things. Abnormal lab tests, a person may have infection, a person may have repeated accidents, and we find those symptoms when we explore further about why they came to see us. For both genetics, or for both uh, cardiac disease and addiction, genetics are an important part of it. Life experiences are an important part of it as well. We talked about those with addiction, but those very same stressors or life experiences also increase the risk of cardiac disease. There are predisposing conditions for, for both of them, and we know what the outcomes are. If untreated, cardiac disease leads to progressive deterioration in functioning and premature death, and that's the case for addiction too. And if treated for cardiac disease, most survive and do well, but despite that, they might have exacerbations of symptoms when their treatment needs to change a little bit. For addiction, most survive and do well, but despite treatment, things get better and worse from time to time, and we need to update what may need to be done. So what kind of treatment can we or should we provide? Well, there's old and new treatment, and we all know that old is wrong and new is right. You know, eventually new will become old and, you know, we'll do something different again. But it used to be, when I was first got into medicine, the patient had a heart attack, they went into the hospital, uh, they sometimes lived, and then they went home with no further treatment, and if they had symptoms, again, they came back to the hospital and we went through all that again. For addiction treatment, when I first started to get involved with addiction treatment, there would be a crisis, someone would come into treatment for a fixed length of time, often 28 days of inpatient, which got changed to like six weeks of intensive outpatient, and they were sent home with follow-up for AA, and if they had return of symptoms, they didn't get it right the first time, so they needed to start over again. The problem is that both of those were providing acute care for a chronic condition. But by treating a chronic condition, we've learned a lot about cardiac disease. If a patient has a heart attack, they get angioplasty, they get something like, they get angioplasty, they get a stent place or things like that. Most commonly, they live and do well with that, and there are a number of things that are dealt with. Cardiac rehab, diet changes, stopping smoking, medications to prevent relapse, and if there's a return of symptoms, you tweak the treatment a little bit. Same for addiction. The assessment needs to determine what type and intensity of treatment they need. Counseling and 12-step therapy is important. Medications are a very important part for the treatment of opioid addiction, and if there's a return of symptoms, we need to intervene early and tweak that so people can do better with it. As I mentioned, this is an epidemic, and we have to deal with different things in order to be effective. And we learn this from cardiac disease. We need to prevent it or have less people be affected by it in the future. We need to intervene early. So before someone starts to have the full-blown addiction, identify signs of problematic use when it's easier to intervene and have a positive effect than after that. We need to have effective treatment. And again, we know a lot about treatment, and there's some good science out there in terms of what's effective and what's less effective. 
but we don't always offer or provide the more effective forms of treatment. And then life-saving measures. And so if we go back to our cardiac disease, what did we learn about this? We learned about prevention. That yes, cardiac disease is preventable. You can't change your family history, but knowing it makes a difference. And then doing things that help prevent developing that cardiac disease in the first place, like not smoking, exercising, following a good diet, managing stress, and decreasing early life trauma. <coughs> For addiction, we know that in many cases it can be prevented too. Knowing family history, because that's going to elevate risk. Delaying or eliminating exposure to drugs that cause addiction. Managing stress, decreasing life trauma, and then other kinds of intervention like start talking that I'll talk about in a minute here. Early intervention. So before the person has the disease, what kind of things tell us that there may be problems with it? For cardiac disease, we know if we treat diabetes and high blood pressure, lipid problems, we help people stop smoking and things like that, that that's going to prevent people from progressing on to cardiac disease in many circumstances. Prediction, if we identify and treat mental illness early on, or we use something called ESPERT, which is screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment, to identify at-risk behaviors and intervene early on, most of those individuals will not progress to have addiction either. Utilizing the modern evidence-based treatments for tr uh, to help individuals is important, and then life-saving measures. So for cardiac disease, CPR, there's a big push for everyone to learn CPR, and now we see defibrillators all over the place. There are probably even a couple of defibrillators in this building right here. And we have life-saving measures for opioid addiction, too, including the wide availability of naloxone and people to administer. But if we only had CPR and defibrillators, we're not dealing with the whole illness of cardiac disease. If we only look at naloxone, we aren't fully uh, treating the issues associated with opioid dependence either. So how do we get here? So audience interaction here. Which of the following is associated with increased use of an addictive substance. Increased availability, decreased belief in harmfulness of the substance, <coughs> both or neither. So how many say A? Okay, how many say B? How many say C? How many say D? Okay, some of you voted twice. <laughs> we don't tolerate that in Ohio, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it's C, both, both of those. So having more of it available and having people think these drugs really aren't harmful is going to increase use. And if they're addictive drugs, increased use is going to lead to more people being exposed and more people experiencing addiction. So why do I have this up here? Starting in 1997, actually probably a few years before that, it was promoted to medical systems that were really doing an inadequate job of treating pain. We need to do a better job of it. May or may not have been true. Probably was true in some circumstances. But that was seized as an opportunity to say, well, to deal with this pain, what we need to do is be more liberal in prescribing opioid medications, which are addictive medications. A lot of different ways to treat pain. The medications are, are only one part of that. It was promoted by some pharmaceutical companies. Frankly, it was promoted by uh, the uh, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. It was promoted in healthcare organizations. All these things were promoted. And one of the things that was promoted was this article from, I think it was the 1970s, where someone put forth that individuals who have pain and are treated with opioids have very, very low risk of becoming addicted to them. It was like less than 1%, something on that order. So, you know, I was well into my career in addiction treatment at that point. That doesn't make sense to me. Why would people have pain be less likely to experience addiction than the general population? That doesn't make any sense to me. But, um, you know, I wasn't out on the highway saying this is not the right thing to do. I, you know, I don't think it was, you know, we were under treating pain uh, at that point. But there was a major change in culture then from one of 
opioids are addictive medications that should be used sparingly to opioids are not very addictive medications that should be used more liberally. And that was a major transition point. And we can see right here in Ohio, the amount of opioids prescribed in 1997 compared to 2011, this is a three-fold increase. That is an incredible increase. <clears throat> and so one of the mistakes that I hope we learn from is if there's a major change in culture and how we're treating things, we need to follow up for intended and unintended consequences of this. Was pain better treated over this period of time? I don't particularly know because I don't know if anybody actually studied that. Did addiction go up over that time? Yeah, it did. But nobody was particularly studying that until it was starting to get into the late 20, you know, 2008, 2010, 2011. It's like, whoa, we got a problem here. And the problem that we have there were many, but one of them is deaths. And in fact, um, I don't have a slide on this right now. If you looked at death rate compared to increase in prescribing, it's almost, it almost parallels it. There's a clear relationship between the two of them, clear association between, uh, between the two of them. But 2011 is where serious intervention in Ohio started. So not long after Governor Kasich uh, entered office, he said we're going to have a governor's cabinet opiate action team. There are pill mills in various parts of the state where people can just go and get opiates without having a physical exam or anything like that. We're going to shut them down. Uh, and so they were shut down. And some of the people that were doing that are now in prison. Uh, and probably should be in prison because there are people addicted and people who are dead because of the activities that they had. So at that point, we started to see the prescribing uh, go down over time. But the deaths have continued to go up. And you know, we can see where the highest death rates in Ohio. The darker the blue, the higher the death rate. Brown County, and this is from 2015, most recent year we have data for. Uh, Brown County is one of the highest here. Montgomery County is pretty high also. There's kind of this pocket in southwestern and southern Ohio that goes up um, along the eastern border of the state, too. Uh, so the county is right here somewhere uh, in the middle of that. So, I mean, none of this is anything to pat ourselves on the back for. One death is way too many deaths, and we all know that. And the reason the death rates have started to have continued to increase is because of the transition that happened. So, pills or prescription opioids <coughs> increased that. Deaths to them have stayed fairly flat over the but what started to increase was the use of heroin. Now, sometimes you hear, well, heroin went up because the pill mills closed. Maybe to some degree, but you can see the yellow line here is heroin. The uptick in heroin use started well before the pill mills closed in 2011. So why would that be? So you can't relate that directly to the pill mills. Maybe here you can relate it to. I think there are a couple reasons for it. One is purely economic. Heroin's a lot cheaper than prescription opioids. You don't have to see a doctor, uh, you know, somebody can deliver it to a parking lot or your house or, or wherever, things like that. So that's a piece of it. Another piece of it is just the progression of addiction. So as addiction goes, continues to progress in an individual, they move to more and more potent drugs because the drug that they were doing was no longer the one for them anymore. So they need to move to something that is more potent. And heroin is more potent than pills. Heroin is about twice as potent as morphine is. And then we had a newcomer that we started seeing in about 2012, but really picked up in 13, 14, and 15, and that's fentanyl. So fentanyl uh, is uh, a synthetic opioid. It's used in anesthesia and things like that, very appropriately used. The source of the fentanyl is not diverted fentanyl from hospitals or medical settings. The source of the fentanyl had been the same source as the heroin. Basically, it's brought from Mexico, manufactured in China. Some of it now, in fact, is mailed to the United States from China. So that, that's where that came from. So heroin, twice as potent as morphine. Fentanyl, 50 times more potent than heroin. So 50 times the euphoria, 50 times the lethality. 
And then there's another drug which has popped up now and then called carfentanil, which is an elephant tranquilizer, also from China. And carfentanil is 50 times more potent than fentanyl is. So if you're doing the math here and you're saying 50 times 50 times 2 is 5,000 times more potent than morphine, yeah, you're, you're exactly right about that. So that's kind of the trend that we've seen. So that's not a pretty picture. How do we deal with it? Prevention. Let's start with prevention. Prevention is always a lot easier than treatment. Oh yeah, it's a lot cheaper than treatment. So if we could prevent, we don't have to go to treatment. We don't have to have all the consequences. We don't have all of that. We still don't focus enough on prevention for anything. And we should. And early on. So what kind of things help? Talking to kids about drugs. If you talk to kids about drugs, it decreases the likelihood of them using by about 50%. And that's pretty darn substantial. I mean, that just doesn't mean, you know, I see a kid walking on all and say, hey, kid, don't use drugs. I mean, you know, I suppose that's worth something. But it's not the same as actually having a conversation. <laughs> having dinner with family more nights of the week than not, which relates to talking to kids about drugs. And, you know, not having dinner with you know, everybody on their cell phone and communicating to their friends or things like that, but actually, how did the day go? What's going on? Knowing what's going on in one another's lives. Involving kids in extracurricular activities. Uh, scouts, athletics, theater, uh, choir, you know, things like that. Those also help that. None of these eliminate, but they all help. And then decreasing those opportunities for exposure. So we talked before about delaying it as long as possible, and if, as long as possible is never, that's good. Get rid of, getting rid of addictive drugs when they're no longer needed. So you know, the, the Percocet that you have in your medicine cabinet from that hernia repair that you had four years ago, chances are you're not going to need that anymore. Get rid of the drug. And this Saturday, there's going to be uh, a drug take back day. Chief, are you doing that here? Uh, this week. You've got some drop you've got drop boxes around yeah, here. Right? Yeah, so drop boxes, um, drug take back days, and then there are other ways you can get rid of them too. Uh, like mashing them up with kitty litter and putting them in the trash and, and things like that. So there are other things you can do. And then for physicians and other prescribers following the prescribing guidelines. I've got some materials up here about start talking, which is the governor's initiative for this, which talks about ways to do these different things. And there's a really nice website too. So this is something that's really important and is helpful. So we also have prescribing guidelines for physicians uh, and other prescribers to not have excessive amounts prescribed in the first place. So getting rid of the opioids that you have or any drug that you have that you don't need anymore is important. And, and you know, if you think you just might need it, then you still get rid of it. If you're having pain that's so bad that you need a strong painkiller like oxycodone for, you shouldn't be treating that yourself. You need to see somebody about why you're having pain that, that that's that severe. But it would also be helpful if there weren't a lot of leftovers. And one way for there not to be a lot of leftovers is for physicians and other prescribers to make sure that the amount that they prescribe is appropriate for the condition that the person is receiving. If you have a tooth extension, <coughs> how much opioid should you need? Probably none most of the time, right? I mean, usually Advil and things like that would take care of it quite well. But if you do need it, you don't need more than a couple days worth. You certainly don't need 30 days worth. If you have a sprained ankle, how much should you need? Well, you get probably none. If you have a broken bone, maybe a couple days worth. But you don't need lots and lots. And that's something that we had seen. And so there are these different guidelines. And then in March of last year, uh, we had a, a news conference. All of the prescribing boards are putting rules in place for prescribing opioids in acute pain, uh, which is really going to kind of limit it to seven days, except under certain circumstances, and that, which are understandable, and, and, and that's OK. But to try to decrease the amount that's available for the uh, for acute pain and to have less that people can uh, use for um, less appropriate circumstances. The first use of an opioid 
What do you think the source of that opioid is most commonly? The dealer on the street? Medicine cat. Yeah, it's family or friends. Sometimes given to someone, sometimes stolen from someone, but family and friends. So you think about that. When there's a kid who's visiting in your house or your own kids, kids visiting, they have to go to the restroom, they open up their medicine cabinet, there's a pill bottle there, we can eliminate that risk factor. And we should eliminate that risk factor. So what's happened with these guidelines? Well, we've seen about a 20% reduction in uh, prescribing of opioids in Ohio between 2012 and 2016, most of it in the past two years. So you look at that and you say, okay, well that's pretty good. But that's still 57 for every man, woman, and child in Ohio. I didn't get my 57 last year. And I think most of us in this room didn't get our 57 last year. Now, I'm not saying that there are not people who need opioids long term for certain kinds of medical conditions. Absolutely, there are circumstances that that's the case. But there's a lot of excess opioid out there too, which can go for ill purposes. Early intervention. So I mentioned this thing called screening brief intervention or referral for treatment. It's something that has been initially used in primary care practices, uh, but it's also adaptable to school settings and other kinds of things to help identify people who are at risk for problematic use. And then let's talk about treatment a little bit. So this is Bill Wilson and Dr. Robert Smith, who were the founders of Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholics Anonymous was founded in Akron, Ohio, right here in our own state in 1936. And that's something we should be really proud of. We should be as proud of them as we are of the Wright brothers for initiating flight, the Ohio ones who were the pioneers. Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob offered hope and help to people who didn't have any before. And thousands, probably millions of individuals worldwide have been helped with 12 steps. But just like we're no longer flying biplanes, we learned from that and we've been able to add to that so that air transportation takes us to another place. We have science, we have technology, we have other things that can take us to another place and provide even more effective treatment than 12-step alone. 12-step is a terrific program, not only for addiction treatment, but for life in general and having relationships and things like that. And we should be proud and we should honor them appropriately as the pioneers of addiction treatment. And one of the things they recognized that we have not recognized well enough, well, well enough is the chronic disease aspect of addiction. Dr. Bob and, and uh, Bill W. tried to quit drinking on their own numerous times. But it was only by helping each other that they were able to have longer term success. They knew this was a relapsing disease. We know this is a relapsing disease. And what we know is that the relapse rates for addiction are pretty much the same as they are for any other chronic illness. That about 50% of people, whether they have diabetes, drug addiction, hypertension, or asthma, have a relapse at some point. So you know, we shouldn't vilify people for having a relapse. We should understand this is part of the disease and what do we need to do to have other things happen. The big difference is if I don't take my medication for my high blood pressure, and my blood pressure goes up, who knows about that? Nobody, right? Because I have a stroke. Nobody knows about that. If I relapse with my drug addiction, who knows about that? Everybody. Everybody's around you. And we say, well, treatment doesn't work. No, treatment works. And treatment works very well. But treatment's not infallible. And it's not one size fits all and we need to adapt appropriately uh, to, the, to the individual and what their needs are at any given point. We know that recovery as a, that addiction as a chronic disease requires a long-term commitment. It's not until you reach a year they have about a 50-50 chance of long-term recovery. And it's not until you reach five years that there's about a 90% chance of long-term recovery. So we need to do whatever we can to retain people into treatment and, they, and, and things like that. So we need to treat the whole person. There's not just one thing to do. 
we need to consider that addiction affects every aspect of a person's life. That it affects their spiritual life, their physical life, their emotional life, their relationships. It affects every aspect of that. And merely taking the substance away doesn't heal all of it. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. So we really need to treat the whole person in order to be effective with that. Which gets us to talking a little bit about medication for the treatment of addiction. Why should we use medication to treat addiction? The relapse rate is really high without medication for opioid addiction, maybe as much as 90%. And there's some good reasons for that. If a person's exposed to reminders of addiction, that can trigger craving. If they're given even low doses of opioids, that can rekindle the use also. And those cravings and that preoccupation with use and things like that really limit the availability, the ability of patients to develop the coping skills that are necessary for long-term recovery. It improves the recovery rates and it improves function. People who receive medication-assisted treatment are less likely to be arrested, they're more likely to be employed, they have more family stability, they're less likely to die. So those are good things when it is used appropriately. And so we have three basic kinds. We've got an injection called Vivitrol, which is a long-acting drug. We've got buprenorphine or Suboxone, uh, which uh, acts on the opioid uh, receptor itself. And then we've got methadone. Which of these is better? I couldn't tell you. There haven't been any kind of head-to-head -head studies that say this one's better than this or this one's better. So we have to go on our clinical judgment with it, basically. And there's a need to tailor it to the individual based upon what their needs and what the availability might be. And then we've got naloxone. Naloxone or um, Narcan is something that reverses opioid overdose and is very effective also. Um, in about the past 15 years, when you add up deaths each year, Ohio's lost about 21,000 people to opioid overdose. Over that same period of time, 104,000 people were treated with naloxone. So four times as many, four or five times as many, had an opioid overdose reversed also. So it's something that is, that is helpful and can save lives. So when we talk about these medications, I hear certain things. It's a crutch. I don't see anybody on crutches. Has anybody been on crutches? Where are they? They're in the garage. Yeah, mine are, mine are in the basement. Yeah. Uh, and why are they in the garage? You don't need them anymore, right? When you needed them, you needed them. They helped you function for a period of time. They helped you go about your life until you didn't need them anymore. So when I hear it's a crutch, it's like, well, okay, what's so bad about a crutch? And the other thing I hear is, well, why would you use a drug to treat a problem with a drug? If we've gotten nothing else out of this, I hope that we've understood that the issue is not the drug. The issue is the brain's response to the drug. This is not a drug disease. This is a brain disease. We're not using a drug to treat a drug. We're using a medication to treat a brain disease. We use anticonvulsants to treat seizures, a brain disease. We use antidepressants to treat depression, a brain disease. We have medications we can use to treat this brain disease which are helpful also. They are not the entirety of it. If people only get the medication and they don't get the other treatments associated with it, don't bother. You need to have the whole aspect of it in order to be effective. And it needs to be monitored appropriately too. So what can we do? Talk to kids about drugs, really important. Clean out your medicine cabinet, really important. All of us can do these things. Delay exposure to any drug abuse including tobacco. Be part of the community response. Everybody here is already on the board with that. Understands that it's a chronic relapsing disease. And a relapse is part of the illness. It's not a failure. We talk about the person failed treatment. Is it really the person that failed treatment? Or is it the treatment that failed the person? That's something we need to think about. And being part of the community response is so important. I had to say it twice and fighting the stigma. And this is a brain disease. We don't need to stigmatize it further. When we approach this from other than a disease perspective, that it's a moral weakness or something of that nature, 
someone relapses and we berate them for relapsing, what we do is we add to that person's guilt and shame. And many of these individuals had a lot of guilt and a lot of shame before they ever became addicted. And they develop further guilt and further shame as a result of their active addiction. And then they relapse and we add on to that. And how do people who have addiction cope with guilt and shame? They use. That's not really helpful, is it? So I guess the bottom line is we need compassion, we need understanding, we need to work with one another, we need to not blame one another, we need to challenge one another to do the best that we possibly can. But we need to use our energies in a collective kind of way to be able to turn this around. When we use our energies to argue, to find blame, to uh, not collaborate, we're not serving our community well, we're not serving people with addiction well. And I think most people are out there working as hard as they can, doing the best they can with all of this. We need to keep our own resources with this. We need to support one another. We need to consider what our first responders are facing when they are administering four times or 10 times as much naloxone as they were a few years ago. And they have positive things when they see someone that they can wake up <coughs> and turns around with it. And then they also see the negative things on those individuals that they see day after day trying to turn this around. It, it can create trauma. And so we need to be patient with that. We need to support our first responders. We need to support our treatment providers. In addiction treatment, we aren't used to people dying. And some of the people we're treating were dying. In fact, sometimes our treatment may make it even more likely that they die. Because when a person gets treatment and they get detoxified, if they're not on medication-assisted treatment, they've lost their tolerance to the drug. And if they relapse, the amount of drug that they used to use to get high could be the amount of drug that's necessary to kill them. And so we need to work with having those effective treatments, but we also need to understand the impact that this is having on the families, on the treatment providers, and on the first responders, uh, as I recommended. We're gonna turn this around, but we're gonna turn it around collectively. I'm not going to turn it around by my office in, in my office in downtown Columbus. I'm going to be part of it. I'm going to be part of that community response, and I have been for a number of years. And some of you have been for a number of years, too. And if this is the first time you've been here, welcome. We need everybody's, everybody's support in order to be able to do this. So um, thank you for inviting me here. <laughs> I know we can do this because you're the Newark Wildcat. Yes. <laughs>
uh, you know, you hear about, you know, well, Betty Ford, they got a great recovery rate. Is it because Betty Ford has a great program? No, it's because Betty Ford has people who can pay 20,000 bucks cash out of pocket. They have families, they have jobs, they have income. You know, they have all those kind of things that, that, um, that promote recovery. That a facility like Mary Haven doesn't have in their patient population. So, um, what is bottom? Unfortunately, in 15, we had 3,005 people that bottom was death. That's not an acceptable bottom to me. Uh, you know, some of the things I've learned, and this isn't scientifically based, I used to uh, make predictions, and I stopped making predictions. You know, I'd tell somebody, you know, oh, if you keep up like this, you're going to die from this addiction. Which never worked, as I can best tell. Because one, if they didn't die, they've proven you're wrong, so your advice was totally worthless. And if they did die, they didn't come back and say, well, Dr. Hurst, you know, you were right, I died from that. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, I just stopped doing that. And, and I, instead, I try to build people up and say, this is something that you can do. Because thousands and tens of thousands and millions of people in the world do it. And so, I, I, I think the hope of a better life the hope of one that is not, that all decisions are not a consequence of addiction is something that we just need to continue to promote. Thank you. 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 Thank
Scott Fulton, Chief Probation Officer for the Lincoln County Common Pleas Court, will be talking about uh, his role in these community efforts. So, talk about how we supervise drug offenders traditionally, uh, meaning people who aren't who aren't in the drug court uh, case load. Uh, Leah Nairn, who is currently the drug court coordinator for the drug court program I have, is going to be talking about how she supervises the drug court participants that are in the drug court. And then you will hear from two participants in the drug court, Amanda Jordan and Andrew Foltz, both of whom will be telling you their own story of how they ended up in drug court and where they are today. I know it's late, um, so I would encourage questions. I think that this part of the program um, will bring, um, kind of like the dispatch videos, a human element to this because we've got people who are in the program who are doing well. That's why we ask them to speak. And um, um, I think that people get more out of these kinds of programs when they hear people who've been directly affected by it and who address those uh, challenges head on and made progress. So um, let me talk just a little bit about the history of drug courts how they started nationally, how they started locally, and how we operate them here, and then I'll turn it over to Justine. Drug courts are judicially supervised court dockets or caseloads that provide a sentencing alternative of treatment combined with intensive supervision for people with serious substance abuse and or mental health disorders. Because a lot of people in the system have both. Um, drug courts attempt to treat people with dignity and integrity to promote lasting change. And they do that by utilizing a treatment team. People with special skill and professional training to help judges and probation officers make the right decision and, and get proper outcomes for people in drug court programs. So let me, uh, before I go any further, let me introduce the people who are on my treatment team because they make my job, they do most of the work and they make my job 10 times easier. Uh, Leah Naren is the drug court coordinator. Scott Fulton is the director of our probation department. Jim Fister is uh, with Behavioral Health Care Partners. He deals with the mental health sides of, of our clientele. Phil Casby is with LAP. He's in the treatment team. There's Phil. Uh, Holly Linton is with LAP. Sam Britton. Sam. Sam works for the Child Support Enforcement Agency and provides us critical information and help about how we can get people uh, compliant with child support and uh, things like that. Fred Wolf from Shepherd Hill, part of the pro treatment team. Tamara Fry from Woodlands, and Hawkin Flanagan, who is an assistant prosecutor, just joined the treatment team. I don't know if he's here or not. The treatment team meets every week, and we discuss every case uh, that I will deal with <coughs> later that afternoon. And they provide me updates on progress. They tell me who has. Um, fallen short and complying with the terms and conditions of their supervision. And we, together as a team, generally um, come up with an idea about how someone should be sanctioned or uh, rewarded if they're doing well. Um, so that's really the hallmark of how drug courts work. Uh, it's that treatment team aspect to help a judge get all the information that he needs and all those resources pulled together to help people the way uh, they really need help. Drug courts are not new, and they're not specific to the heroin problem. They were developed as a result of the cocaine, the crack cocaine epidemic in Florida in the late 80s. So they've been around for 30 years. Um, there are over 3,000 drug courts in the United States today. When I became a judge in 2003, I go to these judicial seminars. I listen to doctors like Dr. Hurst talk about evidence-based uh, 
uh, results and I hear other judges or other practitioners talk about the success they were having with drug courts in uh, their jurisdictions and finally about five years after I became a judge I said to Scott Fulton who was the probation director at the municipal court at the time I said hey we should start one of these and uh, I think he said to me he said yeah I mentioned this about two years ago <laughs> <laughs> I think he did and we had a probation officer named uh, uh, Michelle Hammond, who was also anxious to become part of a drug court treatment team and a drug court coordinator. And so we essentially uh, called somebody from the Supreme Court. They had some people on staff whose job was to help courts develop these programs. And we went maybe to a drug court or two to watch how they did their program. And we developed our own program. And we geared it toward people who in the municipal court arena, uh, we thought at the time that we, our clientele should be people who suffer from mental health disorders. Because a lot of the clientele uh, in municipal court particularly are repeat customers who don't quite get their needs met in terms of mental health services, in terms of uh, drug and alcohol services. A lot of them self-medicate and as a result, are back in the criminal justice system time and time again. Not with really serious offenses, but domestic violence, assault, not that those aren't serious, but they're misdemeanors, so they're in municipal court. So we developed this program, put together a treatment team, and um, came up with the lift court, which is what Judge Stansbury currently presides over today. He's modified his team a little bit, his program, and then when I became a judge in 2010, on a police court, I thought, you know what, we should do the same thing, except over here our jurisdiction is a little bit different. Our caseload's different. We see more drug cases because most drug offenses are felonies. And so let's treat or let's create a drug court over here. Um, and that's what we've done. Um, Leah's going to talk more about kind of the statistics of the program. You're going to hear from two of the participants of the program, which will be much more interesting than probably any of us have to say. But, um, you know, my, my involvement with drug courts almost 10 years now is that if they're done the right way, according to best practices, <coughs> they can be successful. Are they always? No, they're not. I think we graduated uh, about 50 people from the Common Police Court program. Um, our recidivism rate is about... Uh, I would say 92% have not reoffended in two years. Well, we've had an 8% recidivism rate. Unfortunately, we've had a graduate OD not long after his graduation from the program. We've had a total of, uh, and I'm talking fatal, overdose. We've had a total of about four fatal overdoses of participants while they've been in the program. So these folks, while they're in the program, they have to come and see me every week. That's part of the program, judicial supervision. And the idea is that if people, unlike traditional probation, you get on probation, you never see the judge again unless you screw up. But this way, you're on supervision, it's much more intensive, and you have to come and see the judge again whether you've done well, and if you have, you'll be rewarded. And if you haven't, then you're going to be sanctioned immediately, including jail. And we've discovered that the most effective sanctions generally are swift and mild, usually no more than a seven-day jail sentence. You can back out into the program, re-engage in the treatment, things like that. Um, so let me let me just before I turn it over to Judge Stansbury, let me um, ask you to consider a couple of these facts because I think if you think about this, it'll give you a better idea of why drug courts developed in response to a drug crisis that occurred 30 years ago, and why they're still relevant today, and why we're still dealing with the same types of issues, even though the drug of the day might be different. Um, 
United States has 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's prison population. Approximately 2.4 million people are in federal and state prisons or local jails. Another 4.7 million are on probation or parole. These numbers are much higher than they were 30 or 40 years ago, despite a relatively flat crime rate, and, at least in Ohio, a relatively flat population. The European prison population rate is approximately 133 inmates per 100,000 people. In the United States, it's 478 people, prison population, per 100,000 people. That's more than three times the rate of incarceration. Here's another one that'll make you think. The United States, with 5% of the world's population, consumes 85% of the world's opiates. And there's a whole lot of reasons why. Dr. Uh, Peirce talked a lot about that. But it is a problem that the courts have to deal with. And traditional uh, incarceration does not treat addiction, generally speaking. There are some programs that people take, but uh, it's not nearly as effective as the kind of treatment we try to get people involved in drug courts. So, uh, with that, um, let me turn it over to Judge Stansberry, and he can talk to you about his experience and his perspectives leading the lift court in this Uh, good afternoon. Again, I'm Judge David Stansbury from the Municipal Court. Before I jump into what I was going to talk about, um, I didn't know a whole lot about today's program before I actually showed up for breakfast this morning. But I'm getting the impression that this is really designed to educate you as educators about the epidemic that's out there and how it's affecting the families that you serve in our community. So let me uh, state this. The drug courts are still open proceedings to the public. Um, and if you ever want to come down and watch a session of drug court, just call either my office or Judge Branstool's office. We can make that happen. But on a more fundamental level, if you simply, if you know that you have a student that you're dealing with whose, whose parent or uh, guardian is in one of the drug courts, you can get updates. You can talk to our probation officers, the ones who run our programs, um, and, and get regular information about how they're doing and what's going on. Because if they screw up and they go to jail for the weekend or five days or whatever, that's going to affect the kid. So uh, feel free to do that. It's, it's, it's nothing is confidential. It's all open and out in the public. Um, I do the lift court now. It was started by Judge Branstool, as he mentioned, back in, I think, 2008. Um, and he kind of alluded to the fact that it started off as a mental health court. Um, some of you may be familiar with the term co-occurring disorder or dual diagnosis, but we find that in the population that we deal with, the vast majority have both mental health and substance abuse problems. So we kind of morphed from a mental health court only into what I call the behavioral health court, which dealt with both. Um, and then the Ohio Supreme Court came along and said, you can't be that, you have to be one or the other. So we decided we'd be a drug court, and um, we still treat mental illness because that's a pretty big component of it. I have a treatment team too, um, with representatives from the um, treatment agencies, lab, woodlands, um, behavioral health care partners. We have a prosecutor, a defense lawyer. We have a law enforcement representative. And uh, my, uh, the coordinator for my program, or the, the officer in charge, is Ms. Carla Fowler. She's, she's here today, too. So um, we, we got her from Texas. She's actually from here originally, but we brought her back up from Texas because we were so impressed with her. So <laughs> we're happy to have her. Um, you know, the whole purpose or the whole theory behind drug courts is that with Increased contact between the judge and the probationer, combined with um, immediate graduated rewards and sanctions for good and bad behavior, respectively, is the most effective model of behavioral change. And that's exactly what drug courts are trying to do. They're trying to affect behavioral change in the population. And I tell our new participants, point blank, 
We are trying to break you down and rebuild you. Because as you are right now, you come to us completely broken. And when they get resistance, I say, how things been working out when you've been doing what you want to do? So why don't you turn it over to us and let us tell you what to do for a little while. And by and large, our population is pretty receptive to that. So, you know, Judge Bristol and I went out to a national training last year in Reno, Nevada, which is where the National Judicial College is. And the woman who was kind of coordinating this conference, who was a former probation officer in, I think, Oklahoma, said that uh, when she got assigned to her first drug court, she was like, oh, great. They're sending me to clapping court. Well, they call it clapping court because if you happen to be in drug court session, we clap a lot. Um, there was a lot of resistance to drug courts because people thought it was hugs for thugs. Uh, the fact of the matter is there's accountability, but there's also encouragement. And I think you can all agree, especially those of you in the educational system, <coughs> most people respond better to encouragement than they do to punishment. Um, punishment is corrective. Encouragement is um, much longer lasting, in, in my opinion. And the theory is, you know, as I said, these graduated incentives and sanctions, this is the latest theory of criminal sentencing, if you would. And, uh, you know, there have been a lot of theories. You know, we had the three strikes and you're out policy. Well, that didn't seem to really change, you know, the crime rates. Uh, we had the more liberal, more allowing, some would say more coddling um, theories about how to treat criminal defendants. And that didn't seem to work well. Um, so this is the latest theory. And, and, and as Judge Branstall said, it's not new. This has been 30 years. Um, the, there's enough research out there that it's been validated. If you do it right according to the way you're supposed to do it, um, there's a proven track record of reducing um, recidivism, which is just a fancy word for saying great offender. So what are incentives and what are sanctions? Well, um, number one, anytime anybody mentions their sobriety time, whether it's a week or whether it's a year, no matter if they're in the middle of their sentence, everybody in my court spontaneously breaks their applause because you want to applause today, 36 days clean, good job, all right? Um, when people graduate, they come up and they'll say, you know, they give kind of like a lead, what you're going to hear about later today. And uh, they'll kind of say in the first, well, I started using blah, 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 and I haven't used since then. And then even though they're in the middle of the sentence, people break into spontaneous applause. So that's always kind of interesting. We developed, um, it's a, it was always easier for courts to come up with punishments than it was for sanctions or for incentives. So we really kind of struggled with incentives for a while. What we did was we developed a, a, a system that we call star cards. And they're like little business cards, and they have little stars on them, hence the name. And it says, uh, congratulations for, and there's a blank. So I can write in whatever they've done, whether it's, you know, reached a 30-day milestone of sobriety, whether they've obtained employment, gotten their own place. And the theory behind those is kind of like the same theory as behind the, the coins and the keychains from the 12-step programs. Something tangible to hold on to so that when they are struggling, they can pull those out and look at them and say, hey, you know, I can do this. That sounds corny, but quite frankly, you know, sometimes that's the difference between a relapse and, and, and continued success. So... You get enough of these star cards, you can go for what we call the prize bowl. The prize bowl is just a fish bowl with a bunch of pieces of paper on it with a number on it. One, two, or three. And depending on what number you pull, you get either like a, what is it, 25, 50, or, do we have 100? No. It's like 15, 25, and 50, right? Okay. So, in true carnival fashion, we only have like three numbers that you get 50 for. So we kind of, you know, we make it better, more likely that you're going to get the 15. Because, you know, we're a court. We don't have all sorts of money. Um, and so that's something to look forward to. Also, at every graduation, um, and we typically will only graduate one person at a time. My personal theory is, and, and different courts are different, my personal theory is this person has worked so hard to get to that point, they deserve to be the focus of attention. And every time somebody graduates, we have a pizza luncheon down in uh, city council chambers. And so we also use those star cards and we raffle off an invitation to the pizza lunch um, so that they get to come and participate in that. And then also we, we raffle off some gift cards on that as well. So they really love their star cards. And they're certainly not shy about telling me if I've forgotten to give them one. I think, I think on Friday, um, I finished up with somebody. And the way I always finish up, they have to write essays. And I'll say, uh, how was the essay this week? And, either Jim Fister or another member of the treatment team, like Tamara, who's there, will, will inevitably say, look good, Judge, look good. And then that's it. And uh, one of the uh, participants was getting her book back. She goes, hey, Stansbury, you going to give me a card for this? And I said, oh, yeah, I guess I owe you one. So they are covered. They sound corny, but they are covered. Now, sanctions. Sanctions can be anything. Sanctions can be a verbal warning. Sometimes, sometimes it can be a stern verbal warning. It's kind of like double secret probation for animal house. 
Um, that's because when I don't really want to do something worse to somebody, but they've already gotten a verbal warning because you're supposed to, you know, step it up. But then we can do um, community service hours. Um, we typically do them in five-hour increments, um, and we try to tailor them to the to the sanctions are always tailored to, to what happened. So one of the best examples I can think of is we had an individual who was having a difficult time coming down and being reporting to the probation department when she was supposed to um, in the morning. And frankly, the treatment team uh, believed, and I agreed with them, that it was generally out of laziness. So she failed to appear on a, on a timely basis often enough that she ultimately worked with some community service hours. And I said, well, how can we, you know, not only punish her, but address this reason why she's being punished? And one of our treatment team members said, well, that's easy. Make her do community service. And I said, right. And she said, wait, you're going to make her do it at the dog pound on Saturdays when they have to report at 8 a.m. I thought, oh, that's good. I like that. So we gave her 20 hours. She had to do it four weeks in a row, getting up and being there by 8 a.m. And then as an incentive within the sanction, I said, if you show up like you're supposed to the first two weeks, then I'll wipe out those next two weeks that you owe me. And she did. Um, and that kind of tends to prove the whole thing. Beyond the community service hours, uh, well, when we have relapses, sometimes we'll do what we call timelines. They have to kind of go through, you know, what happened. Not just like, oh, I got drugs and I used them. They have to go and go backwards to when they first started thinking about it, what the trigger was, you know, why, what they, they didn't do that, that led to the actual use of the drugs and what they did after and how they felt. That's designed to try to make them think about what happened so that, again, it doesn't happen in the future. Um, I made a guy one time write a, a letter to, uh, to um, was it to his daughters? Or to himself? Well, we did one to the mom. We did one to uh, the large. I, did, I had one guy um, write a letter to, um, as he, uh, to his sober self. I had another person, we had one person write an obituary, their own obituary. It's really all just designed to get them to think about exactly what's going on. And, and I will say this, you know, I don't think it's cliche to say this. It really is life and death, what we're doing. Um, I don't know whether we have any representatives of the media here, but raise your hand if you can remember in the last, I don't know, two months, reading an article in the, in the, in the New York Advocate about a fatal overdose on Lincoln County. Mm -hmm. Can anybody? Okay, well then you guys are reading it closer than I am. Because honestly, I can't remember seeing a single story about it. And the fact of the matter is, those of us who are involved in the system and are dealing with this epidemic know how serious it is, but somebody at the breakfast this morning talked about compassion fatigue, and all we talk about is opiate epidemic, heroin epidemic, whatever. People are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. If they were aware of the fact that we have at least one fatal overdose in Lincoln County every week, they might not be as fatigued about what we're trying to accomplish here. So when I say it's life and death, it really is. The most serious sanction that we can give is jail, and the, all the research says you never put anybody in for more than, well, they say three days, but you know, we'll sometimes do five. Um, if it's really bad or we need to get them out of a dangerous situation, sometimes it's seven. Um, but the theory is that if you put them in jail too long, they're basically just going to say whatever, and they're just going to go back to their behavior in the past. Um, so it's really important that they see results. It's really important that they see fairness. It's really important that, that they see consistency. And so, you know, we've had a great success rate as well, um, but sadly, you have your failures too. And, you know, I always tell my people, the greatest irony of this program is, is that when we're finished with you, if you successfully graduate in six months, I'm not going to remember your name. And be, I won't remember your name because guess what? I won't have seen you in those six months. I'll remember you. I'll remember everything about you. I always point out I remember the guy who always wore overalls and he put holes in his sobriety coins and made a necklace out of it. But I couldn't <laughs> tell you what his name is because he hasn't been back. And that's the goal of our program. Once again, I would encourage you, if you want to come and watch a, a drug court session, by all means, you're more than welcome to. Just contact the, the judge's offices. And if you have people who have relatives in the drug court system and you want to know what's going on, by all means, we're happy to share that information. So thank you very much. Hello. I'm Scott Fulton. I'm the director of adult court services for Lincoln County Common Police Court. Um, I've been at Common Police Court now for almost three years. Prior to that, I was at Municipal Court for about 18 years. Um, like Judge Bransfield said, uh, we started the drug court over there in 2008. He came to me in the spring of 2008 and said, hey, I want to do a drug court. And I said, thank God. I've been trying to do this for a couple years and I'm glad that you're willing to do it. So we did spend about six months planning the drug court and getting it up and running. 
and um, and and the successful programs we can see. So when I um, the judge asked me to talk about how we supervise drug offenders may not be in the drug court setting. So that's why I'm going to kind of go through the process of how people come to our court and how we may refer them out and and see them um, in the probation department. First of all, when someone comes to us with a new charge, they're placed on pretrial. If they bond out or given an OR bond, we then supervise them in the pretrial setting. They're not on probation yet. They still have their rights per se. They've not been rights have not been taken away because they've not been convicted. So at that point in time, we are supervising them. So we see them, we do an assessment. If we see drug and alcohol issues, we refer them out for an assessment. They're not made to go to treatment at this point in time, but we refer them out and we'd like to get them started because research shows the earlier you can intervene and get them in, into treatment, the more successful they're gonna be long term. So we're also drug testing people at this point in time while they're on supervision, as long as we recognize there's drug and alcohol issue. So during that process also, they have to go through a pre-sentence investigation, depending on what's going on with their case. If they're convicted or if they choose to change their plea, then they go through a pre-sentence investigation. At that point in time, we do a pretty lengthy and in-depth session, sitting down with them, going over their history, and then by that time, you should have also an assessment by local drug and alcohol agencies and mental health agencies, because we can address and see what their issues are, and usually we get um, recommendations. So we can provide all that information to the sentencing judge um, once the person comes back for sentencing and then the judge can make the right determination of what they need to do with their sentence. If they're going to sentence them to prison, if they're sentenced to a local jail, or they're going to sentence them to community control, or what we call probation, or they could do what they call a split sentence, where they may sentence them to jail or prison with the idea of them coming out and then being on supervision, and then we supervise them for a period, them for a period of time. While they're on probation, basically the probation officers, what I like to look, you know, I have an officer, I don't know if he's here, is Colin still here? Colin yes. says this, I hear him say this, and, and it's totally right, we are change agents. That's what our jobs are. Our jobs are to change behavior. And by doing that, we refer people out to the services that they need. <coughs> And sometimes we don't, we not recognize that at first. We think it's a drug and alcohol issue, issue, and we find out later on it's mental health. Mental health's driving that drug and alcohol issue, that whole chicken and egg effect. I personally don't care what's causing one. We just want to address them both. Um, but we're also drug testing people. We have a call-in, randomized call-in system. People, uh, and, uh, depending on where they're at in their supervision, they might have to call in every morning, every day, and it randomizes them. They have to show up to be drug tested. So they don't know when they're going to be drug tested. And then we know when they miss their call, and we know when they don't show up. So then there can be sanctions based on that. And so I kind of just wanted to go over, I don't want to, I'm, Leah's going to talk more about the drug courts, so I'm not going to really get into drug courts as much because she's going to talk about the specifics of that. But I will tell you the difference, because all the years of me working in probation, and the difference of drug courts and regular probation, the, the real big difference, and research shows this, is the judicial interaction. Seeing that judge every week. That's the accountability. That's the difference of probation and, and drug courts. And that's why people in drug courts are most successful. Because they, people on probation have been involved in the criminal justice system. And Andy and Amanda might talk about this. The only time they usually go in front of a judge is when something bad happens. They never go in front of a judge when something good happens. And likewise, the judges don't really ever see people unless something bad happens. So it's a change for judges, uh, especially older judges that have been on the bench for a while to start one of these programs because they're not used to telling people, good job, attaboy, you know, and that's then, and well, well, correct me if I'm wrong, but, uh, and also incentives, and they, they didn't speak to incentives about probation. We're not used to incentivizing people, we're used to doing sanctions. So that's a change for us to think about that, saying good job or giving people certificates, you know, claps, we clap them for people, that's big, so people, a lot of people in these systems have never had that before. So, Judge also wanted to talk about funding. I will let you know, both of our drug courts that we started here in Lincoln County, we started out with no funding. No extra funding from anybody. We basically said, you know what, this is the right thing to do in our county. We're gonna use the existing resources because, and I, I, did, I did do some research to show when we first started this because I knew people from some of the service agencies came in and said, oh my gosh, you're going to be bringing all these new people to us, this is going to, and I'm like, no, these are the same people that you're already dealing with. 
we actually sat down and we looked who would fit the criteria to fit in drug court if we started it today. And we had a list of 75 people. And I said, okay, go back and look at these people in your agencies. 85% of those people were already involved in those agencies. They weren't new people. These are people we're already dealing with. So we went ahead and started the drug courts without any new funding. We said, hey, let's redo our services, be more effective, more efficient, get them involved in services quicker. Let's not wait till they mess up or something bad crisis is going on. Let's start it now. So that's, that was, but I will say now we have funding. I think both drug courts are now funded through a, a, a grant through the Department of Corrections. It's called the Probation Improvement Incentive Grant. We call it the PID grant. But for our drug court, the Home Police Court, that, that grant funds, not, funds a probation officer full time. It also funds training for the probation officer. It, fun, it funds um, our drug testing program, our random drug testing program, drug tests. It also funds treatment. It also funds our Thinking for a Change group. And Thinking for a Change group is the Cognitive Behavioral Therapy group. It funds that, and it also funds a Men's Trauma group. So that grant does a lot. It funds things that we don't, can't really, you know, so we're lucky to have that grant. So there's also um, OMAS, Ohio Mental Health and Addiction Services, has a payroll subsidy grant that'll pay for a probation officer or staff member of the drug court 65% of their uh, salary. We had that municipal court for a couple of years. I don't know if they use it at Common Police Court or not before I got there because we did a bright and pig grant. But there is other funding out there for probation um, for the drug courts. I mean, so. Also, just statewide for drug courts, there's over 220 specialized dockets in the state of Ohio currently. Um, that includes mental health courts, family dependency courts, domestic violence courts, <coughs> Vets courts, vet, veterans courts, and they're out of the 220, over 120 of them are drug courts themselves. So, um, you know, more than half are drug courts, and then they break down to the other types of specialized dockets. So, so I'll have Leah come up and talk about our drug court specifically.
all the way to the end and what happened to that person. Okay, they were accepted in the program. What happened to them? Did they, were they successful? Um, did they complete? Did they get revoked? Did we have to mutually discharge them for, for whatever reason? And so we keep track of those numbers as well. Um, in 2016, we had uh, 51 referrals. Of those referrals, uh, we accepted 31. Um, of those 31 referrals, 12 of them were revoked, um, meaning that it just wasn't working. And we had to put them back through the court system, get them an attorney, get the prosecutor involved, put them back in front of the judge, and, and make a different decision. Um, we also took some really difficult cases last year. We said yes to some really difficult cases. I mean, so I, that, that's why that, that, that number 12 doesn't bother me. Um, and then, so that was about a 60% acceptance rate of those referrals. Referrals to the program um, basically come from within the judicial system, basically from the probation officers, which all my coworkers are sitting back there. Yes, <laughs> uh, so basically what will happen is uh, one of the officers back there will have uh, a case, and, and, and so the other piece of where drug court works is that uh, we're kind of the last stop you know, on before they before they get to prison. So, uh, an officer might have a case of like I, I just don't know what to do with this guy. He's been through treatment, failed treatment. He keeps testing positive. He won't show up. You know, but he's also got these other things going on. One, and then so then that officer will make a referral to drug court. I'll go down and look at them. Maybe mental health or someone from lab will look at them if we need to get a, a, a drug and alcohol test done on them. And then I'll take all that information to the treatment team that he talked about earlier. And we sit around and go, okay, can we help this guy? And in nine times out of 10, we say yes. We give him a shot. Um, we very rarely say no. Um, it's usually the circumstances that are just way out of, you know, that we just don't have any control over. They have charges in other counties and they're gonna have to answer to that county and it's just not gonna work out or they, they don't have transportation or they don't live in the county or, you know, who, who knows what it is. Um, so, and then, so that's kind of how somebody comes into the program, and then once they're in the program, they go through phases. It's a minimum time in each phase. The program itself takes a minimum of 14 months. So if you remember the doctor talked about before, that year, that first year of sobriety was Keith, and, and then the five years on top of that, we keep them in for at least a year, um, minimum of 14 months. Uh, we've had people stay in as much as three, as long as three years. Um, <coughs> And then phase one, I think, is 60 days. Phase two is 90 days. Phase three is six months long. And there's there's certain components to each phase. And there's certain components and, and criteria and kind of like a to-do list that they've got to be checking off. Did I get the treatment started? Am I going to my meetings? Am I working on getting my driver's license? Um, have I complied with my sanctions? Have I, you know, had positive home, you know, outcomes from my home visits? Things like that. Um, and as they move through, um, they get rewarded and, you know, there's the clapping and the certificates that, you know, it's kind of like going from freshman year to sophomore year. And then uh, once they complete everything, um, they're stable, they've got stable housing. And like I said, it's not just about the drugs, the drug use, it's everything. We could have someone with um, negative drug screens, but if, if, you know, for a long period of time, but if, if they're unstable in other areas, they're not taking the mental health medication, they're, they're homeless still at phase three, you know, you're still homeless, let's steal you, let's get them stabilized. It's all of those things combined that we look for so that once they do get to phase four, they're maintaining it, and it's just kind of just like, okay, let's see how you do, and then graduate them. And it's, that's what you see up here, is all these folks met, those, met that criteria. Um, am I missing anything? Um, so I think you have <laughs> Okay, I have a, a quick admission or confession. I have a love hate relationship with drug work. I love it when things go well, when people <laughs> progress and people get sober and meet all the benchmarks and are compliant. I hate it when they're not. And so we're going to end today by having a couple of people in the program who are doing really well. Andrew Foltz is going to come up first. He's been in the program since June of 2016. He's currently in phase three. He has two jobs. He's a taxpayer now. 
Um, and he has given us 84 drug screens since he started the program. He's going to come up and say just a few words, and uh, we'll hear his experience. Andrew? until I got here and was told in the hallway that the other drug board participant had a written out speech that she had timed. <laughs> uh, okay, well, I dove in head first here. <laughs> I uh, was told to, to tell my story. Um, my story starts when I was pretty young. Uh, I started using at the age of 11. Uh, pretty much dove right into that, sort of like this speech here. <laughs> I started smoking marijuana every day, and that continued for a couple of years, and then it moved on to harder stuff. You know, and, uh, somehow I still managed to somewhat get my life together, I guess, considering everything. I uh, had a daughter very young, I, she was born when I was 17, I got a pretty decent job. Drug use slowed down a little bit, but not much really. Uh, then kind of picked back up at work. Uh, showed up to this late, but I heard uh, that guy whose name I can't think of right now uh, talking about prescription drugs, and that's how people get started. That's that's how my opiate addiction started. I worked with a friend of mine, and he had a grandparent that died, so he sort of inherited a bottle of prescription drugs and we started taking them at work. Much like everything else drug related I ever tried, I took to that pretty quickly. And that became daily rather fast. Um, it was back when Oxycontin was everywhere. So I, I graduated to that and still managed to keep it together for a little while, but you know, inevitably <coughs> things started to go south. I lost that job, I went to jail. While I was in jail, I met people that were less than supportive. You know, <laughs> why are you why are you wasting your money on that? You should be doing heroin. It's cheaper. They were right. So when I got out, I started started doing that. So that kept going for a while. That's when I first met Scott there. <laughs> I managed to get in some municipal trouble and. That went all right at first, but then they quickly realized that I had a pretty nasty opiate addiction, probably by me falling asleep in the waiting room. Uh, and I, I managed to wiggle my way through that for a little while, but eventually they just kind of gave up on me, put me in jail for a little bit. I uh, managed to get a different charge before they put me in jail for that, and uh, so when I got out, I was <laughs> right back on probation. Uh, I somehow got through that one, I couldn't tell you how, but uh, pretty much the day that I was released, I started using again. And that pretty much took off for a while. Uh, you know, using a little bit quickly turned into constantly again, and I managed to start getting in trouble again. Never working again, really. <laughs> wasn't until I got in this program that I started working again, actually. But uh, I got in trouble again, and they put me in uh, OBI court, which I'm glad to see that Higgins is here because <laughs> I didn't do that for very long. <laughs> I showed up to that for a couple weeks. And then my dog ate my wizenator, so I quit coming. <laughs> uh, I didn't show up for a pretty good time, really. I never really did show up. They, uh, they finally came and found me after I managed to uh, accumulate a couple felony charges uh, for receiving stolen property, uh, firearms. Sort of ironic because if you knew me personally, you'd know that I could probably have not even fired those guns if I had wanted to. I solely had any kind of anything to do with them because of drugs. You know. And uh, 
So they uh, weren't exactly in a hurry to let me out of jail since I did two weeks of OVI court and two years of running from it. And after, I don't know, two and a half months or so, something like that, being in there, Lita came in and saw me, which shocked me. Uh, wow, they're going to do this with me again. Uh, much to my surprise, they gave me a chance, though. I had to finish out my time for the misdemeanor, and then they let me out on the drug court, uh, which was thus far about the best thing that ever happened to me. You know, I hadn't racked up <coughs> more than a few months of clean time since I was 11 or 12. I mean, unless I was incarcerated, you know. And uh, I, I got 14 and a half months now. start sitting in jail that long, uh, but I, I heard Scott say something about accountability. I heard that word a lot when I first got in drug court, uh, and that definitely was uh, a big part of it. You know, I, I was in the probation office so much in the beginning that there were people that probably would have thought they were in the wrong place if they went in there and didn't see me, <laughs> and you know, that helped. You know, I could run around and do what I shouldn't do for two years before they caught up with me, but if I would have used once, I'm sure that that would have been the day that they did a home visit, or I would have called in and it would have been time to go in and drop. Uh, so that that kept me going in the beginning. Uh, they loaded me down with programming, which drove me crazy at first, but it was a good thing. You know, it helped touch on a lot of issues that I definitely needed to work through that I hadn't even thought about more than I had to any time before this. And it also helped push me uh, to do what I needed to do. You know, I hadn't worked since 2010, and I couldn't wait to get a job, <laughs> just so I would be left alone a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> now I have two, and I wish they would leave me alone. <laughs> I, I had a whole bunch of stuff sitting there listening to everybody else talk that I wanted to say, but of course, uh, going out to BHP, seeing Jim, that has definitely helped a lot. Uh, he's dragged a lot of stuff out of me that I wasn't willing to talk about, but he was very persistent. LAP, which I'm actually about to go to when I leave here, has been very helpful now that I've been sober enough to actually listen to anything that you're saying to me. <coughs> and seeing, uh, seeing Brandstool has been helpful. You know, I see people in there getting torn a new one, and I'm like, I don't want to be that guy. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, have a license for the first time in three years. I'm about to get a car that I won't trade for drugs now. <coughs> And I'm here giving this speech on the fly. <laughs> I'm sure that as soon as I sit down, I'll have a bunch of other good stuff to say about drug court, but I can't think of it right now, so I'm going to go ahead and let Amanda say what she's got to say, because I know that she's over there chomping at the bit. <laughs> program since September of 2016, and probably a year before that, I sent her to prison because she pled guilty to aggravated robbery for, I think, driving a getaway car or beauty. I robbed a drug dealer. For, for a drug dealer uh, robbery. Um, I sent her to prison, and I let her out early, and if I remember right, I probably voted against her coming into the program. I don't remember that, but I remember thinking 22 or 3 years ago, 
one of the first cases I was assigned to represent on a court appointed case was Amanda's father. And I don't know if she knows that or not, but I remember thinking back to that connection and I thought, there is no way this person is going to be successful in drug court. And uh, she has been. And, uh, you know, I, I always sometimes think and say, we're all better than the worst thing that's ever happened to us, or the worst thing that we've ever done. And um, at least a vast majority of us are. And uh, I can't think of anybody who epitomizes that right now in her recovery than Amanda. So she's going to come up here and tell you about her situation. And uh, if she ever relapses or goes back to the dark side, I'm really going to be mad. <laughs> Amanda Jordan. I'm a recovering heroin addict. Um, I started using heroin um, about eight years ago. Um, it started off um, just with pain pills. My mother had a prescription. Um, I never really thought much of it until I got into a relationship and he was also an addict. Um, and then he just started taking them. I um, mean, eventually the pills ran out where I got caught taking the pills and um, didn't have money for any more. Um, so eventually we graduated to heroin. Um, and that was like really the first time I had really seen drugs. Um, my mom was alcoholic and so was my dad most of my childhood. Um, and my dad was in prison most of my life. So, um, I never really had any experience with it, but the first time I tried heroin, I never thought that it would take over my life the way that it did. Um, in my addiction, I had lost my home. I dropped out of college. Um, I lost my children. My marriage was ruined, and after many years of criminal activity, homelessness, and doing anything I had to to feed uh, my addiction, um, it was inevitable um, I would end up in prison one day. So in 2014, I committed a robbery, um, and I was arrested within an hour. Um, the robbery was for drugs to feed um, my habit. Um, and then I stayed in jail that entire time until it was time for my sentencing. And in April of 2015, uh, Judge Brand stole, absolutely sent me to prison. Um, I was sentenced to serve four years at the Ohio Reformatory for Women. Um, at that time, I was devastated. My family was heartbroken. Um, It was some, one of the worst things I ever had to deal with, knowing that I would be away for that long. Um, while I was in prison, um, of course, I had a job the whole time I was there. There isn't a whole lot of treatment there. Um, I never really got in trouble, just did what I had to do. Um, later that year, I did file for my judicial release, and it was granted. I was brought back to Licky County, and I was sentenced to go to a career, uh, CBCF in Akron, Ohio, which I did that, I completed that. Um, I knew once I completed CBCF that I would be on um, community control for a period of five years. Um, at the time of June last year, I was released. Come back to Newark, within a month and a half, I was back out using, right back to my criminal behavior. And it didn't take but a week for me to land myself right back in jail. So I sat in jail for a little while. Um, and I'd spent, through prison and treatment, I'd been sober for 19 months. I thought that I had this beat, this overcome. But the difference is when you're in prison and you're in a treatment facility, drugs are unobtainable. 
or they're hard to get. Um, and you don't have a lot of the pressures, you know, that you do when you get back out into society. So I, when I come back to Lincoln County, and I went right back to my mother's, um, it was hard. As soon as people knew that I was out, it's kind of, they're hitting me up, I'm hanging out with the wrong people, not doing what I'm supposed to be doing for probation. And I knew that I was on the drop-in. I knew exactly when I was dropping, what day I had to see my PO. And my addict brain, there it goes, playing the system. So eventually that didn't work, and I landed right back in jail. Um, and my probation officer at the time was most definitely like you're going back to prison. You're lucky he even let you out. Um, so I, I, I feared that I was going to go do the remainder of my time. Um, I spoke with uh, Jim Fister, <coughs> BHP, Lee and Aaron about the drug court program, um, and I did apply um, to be a participant. Judge Branstool absolutely denied me. I believe a few times he said no. I lost it. Um, and, I, and I understand why now, because of my track record and everything on why he didn't want to take a chance on somebody like me. But after a few weeks, and I'm sure a lot of consideration, I was accepted into the drug court program. Um, so the biggest thing for me is when I spoke to Leah about um, why I felt like I should, you know, participate. My thing was, was I wanted to learn how to live in Licking County. I've been here my whole life. I'll be 30 this year. I, want, I didn't want to have to move away and, you know, I, I enjoy living in New York. Um, but I wanted to learn how to be here and not use. I wanted to want not to not want to use. So um, she gave me the opportunity, Ju uh, Judge Branch still gave me the opportunity, um, and I knew that there was nothing left. I wasn't out using a week and I landed right back in jail. Um, the only thing left for me was death at this point. Um, so I entered the program September of last year, not knowing what to expect, but I was willing to do anything to save my life and save my butt from going back to prison. Mm -hmm. um, I have learned so much since that time in September, and um, I've grown so much as a person. Um, I've become aware of my past experiences um, that have kept me sick, um, losing my children, um, failed marriage, I've been through a lot of domestic violence, um, as well as when I come home I found out my mom was um, terminally ill with breast cancer. So I needed to, I wasn't coping and grieving those situations properly and I was just using them as a, an excuse to use or a reason and they just kept me sick. So I needed to talk through and talk and work through my problems instead of allowing them to feed my addiction. To help in my recovery, I started attending self-help meetings, AA, NA. Um, I see a therapist to talk through situations that trouble me and to find positive coping skills for my everyday life. My life still isn't perfect. Things still get on. You know, I just gotta learn you know, new ways to handle when different situations come up without going back out. Um, I engage in lab services. Uh, I see an addiction counselor there. I've also <coughs> completed a grief group to try to help with, um, you know, just losing my kids and my mom being ill, um, and as well as like a family group to understand the relationships that occur in the addiction throughout. And the ways that they impact me um, positively and negatively. One class that really helped me through um, the services, through drug court, is thinking for a change. And it took me a while to get it, is all these bad decisions that I've made. Well, I've sat and pondered about them the whole time I was in prison, and why am I still doing this? Clearly, I'm not doing something right. Well, it was my thinking. 
Um, so we went over different ways on, you know, my different thinking errors and what I was doing wrong. So as of today, I can replace bad thoughts with good thoughts, you know, and really change my behavior and know the right and wrong thing to do for a positive outcome. Um, all the information and skills I've learned to utilize have and will continue to be an essential part of my recovery. I have came to believe that there is hope and I can overcome my addiction and I strive to do so every day. Drug court has truly been a blessing. I have been given structure that I so desperately needed. I am held accountable every day and I have been provided with services and treatment that have been intricate in my success. I work with great providers who I feel understand addiction and have went through great lengths to help me. I have very little family support, although through this program and recovery fellowships, I've been given people who care and want to see me be successful. They give me motivation and positive reinforcement I need to achieve my goals. My dad has dealt with um, a lot of addiction throughout his life and just doesn't, um, he has more anger towards me using than anything. My mother doesn't really understand or doesn't comprehend. Um, so they, they're really hard to believe that I've made a change. I've been doing the same thing for, you know, almost 10 years. They're like, oh, it's just, she's never gonna change. And, you know, so the more I do and the more I, you know, reach and obtain my goals, I hope that one day that they can see that this isn't just, you know, another time I said I got clean or um, I said I was doing better. Now I can really prove it. Um, and, I honestly don't know where I'd be without the drug court program. If I wouldn't end up back in prison, I'd be dead on the street somewhere, and I know that. Um, I couldn't have done this on my own. Um, the great providers that I've had, and the individualized programming. Not everybody's the same. Not everybody's problems are the same. Not everybody grew up the same. Um, not everybody has the same drug of choice. So really working with LAP, the Woodlands, BHP, adult probation, um, and even seeing Judge Branstoll every Monday or however often that I was scheduled to see him for, um, you know, it's really, they kind of understand on, you know, each person has different things going on in their lives and different things that they need to do for themselves. So, um, today I have a stable home. Um, I obtained a valid driver's license after what seems like forever, six <laughs> years, I think. Um, and I just recently gained employment through a local um, company. I struggled really hard with, I do have an aggravated robbery charge. Um, so nobody wanted to hire me. It was just nobody. I couldn't get nobody to give me the opportunity or let me explain. Uh, what I had been doing with my life and where I was, and I was in active addiction and where I am today. So, um, thanks to Leah, my wonderful probation officer, um, she talked to somebody and they gave me that opportunity. So, I actually started yesterday. So, yeah. um, through all my services, my providers, and everything everybody's done for me. Jim Fister, Tamara, Leah, Judge Brand Stoll, um, Sam Messina, everyone I've done any kind of uh, treatment with or just even talking to me because it all helps. Um, I've, I've found a new way of life, a life without the use of drugs. Um, and I've gained a world of knowledge. And today I can gratefully celebrate 273 days clean. Have any answer any questions you might have? Any others? All right, Doug. I don't know how you follow that up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really happy. Uh, both of them. That's it. You handled yourself very well. And, uh, you know, give us hope. Uh, 
that way, and Judge Branson and Judge Stanberry are programs. Fantastic uh, programs, because we talk all the time about it in our studios. It helps a couple people, what we're doing a day like today, it helps a couple people. It's well worth uh, uh, what we're doing. And I know that uh, you know, throughout the day, particularly this, we have, we have parents in our school district that uh, may be in, in your court. I know we have a lot of principals and social workers and such out there that, that certainly uh, this has helped us understand you know, what they're doing and, and going through. And that. so to everybody who hung through the day, hey, drag somebody out there tonight. We're not done yet today. Uh, they would be tonight. But I, I can't try to, that, that is, uh, be able to stand up and say that. I have some knuckles in <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so proud of you.